the meeting to order at six o'clock. First on the agenda, are there any changes or additions? There are not. No changes. All right, we'll move to approving the minutes. The minutes of 1 3 23. Make a motion with approval. Second. I have a motion by Brian and a second by Judy. Is there any further discussion on these minutes? I would just add one thing, Bob, on page five. It's a small thing, but under select board concerns. Okay. We all thank Morrisville Water and Light for their great efforts in getting the power back on. And I just wanted to uh, add Vermont Electric Co op to that list as well. Okay, sounds good. Is there any other discussion? <clears throat> All in favor say aye. 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 Don? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion is passed. <clears throat> Next, do we have any liquor control tonight? All right, hearing none. We'll move to new business. Number one, review draft of the annual town meeting morning. Packet here. You want to take this, Eric? I'm going to turn that to Sarah. This Sarah. is her daily work. Perfect. I was looking to see who was going. Yeah. <laughs> this was a joint effort, putting this um, warning together. You, um, you can't adopt it today because petitions are not due till Thursday for articles, and so more could come in. This is just what we have to date. Um, so there's a draft of the articles that are being proposed. Article 7 is the budget, and there's just X's there because um, you haven't approved your budget yet. So that figure will be put in there. Um, and then along with the warning, there's um, model language. I know that um, there's a petition circulating because I've seen it um, to consider uh, doing the, Australia, the budget by Australian ballot. So I've given you um, a bunch of articles that you can um, consider if you would like to p place on the warning without a petition. Um, one is to elect all officers by Australian ballot. We currently only elect select board members. The other um, is uh, budget articles, um, all public questions, which would be everything that wasn't budget or officers. Um, and then there's the language, if you uh, wish to put an article to change the date of town meeting or change the time of town meeting. So these five model articles, um, you have the authority to place them on the warning, but they have to be voted on on the floor. They can't be voted on by Australian ballot. Um, so those are just sample language. So I don't know if you want to go through one by one. I don't know if you want to glance it over. Uh, on January 30th, we'll have a special meeting. That's the date that we I need you to approve and, and sign the finalized one. But I wanted to get to you the language ahead of time to look over. I know the Article 4 about the reserve, reserve fund called the unallocated reserve fund. When I look at that, um, there's no, doesn't mean any, there's no money being asked for for this, just, just combining two funds. I'm going to let Tina answer that. This is a, this is a Jim Barlow, our municipal law attorney's suggestion for language change to the articles we've asked for previously. We were trying to provide the most legal uh, articles we can, and Jim has made some suggestions which were changed from last year's article. So this article is new in its verbiage, but Tina, where are you Hi, at? Hi, Tina. Hi. I'll just let Tina speak to what the, the content speaks to and why it would change. I guess I'm getting a little anxious. I'm thinking it, this is not Australian ballot. If it was Australian ballot, I think it, be, <coughs> it feels confusing. But since it's not going to be, and it's something that can be explained to me, from the floor, we can explain it before it's voted on. This is similar to what concerned. was voted on last town meeting. Um, what's happened is, is the laws have changed and we used to have to separate out the highway unallocated reserve from the general fund. We don't have to do that anymore. So this takes both of those funds that were voted on last year, combines them into one. Um, it also changes the, uh, mm -hmm. 
Last year it read that there was an amount not to exceed 10% of the prior year's fund balance, and it should have been operating budget, and that was done in error, so that's been corrected in here too, but there is no money being asked. There will be no money raised for this. This is in the event that we have money left over at the end of the year, we could put it in this fund for emergencies, like FEMA-related type emergencies. And our auditors recommend having a fund like this, and we've always had one. So this is more just making it official. That's what, that's what I thought. I just thought the general public reading it might be confused. Are we raising money with this? But no. since we're doing this from the floor, it can be explained, and it's not going to be on right. the Right, no, there's no money being raised here. Yeah. Sarah, can you talk about um, the petition that's going around that is, is going to ask people whether or not they want to have everything be put on Australian ballot, the budget, everything, and what would happen if that does in fact happen? So um, the petition hasn't officially come to me yet. Um, I did see it when I was getting lunch someplace in town last week, so I know it's up, out and about. Um, but I'm pretty sure that they've used the model language from the Secretary of State's office that reads, shall the town of Morristown adopt all budget articles by Australian ballot pursuant to, and then it gives the statute. So basically, because we, um, we are set up to vote everything on the floor unless the voters on a floor meeting have authorized to have us it by Australian ballot that question has to be answered by the voters on a, at a floor meeting so meaning this coming town meeting so there's the choice of you guys can just decide to put it on the ballot you mm -hmm. have that authority if you choose you don't want to or you're not ready to and a petition comes with enough valid signatures by 4 p.m. on Thursday, it will automatically go on the morning, and it would be this year at um, town meeting on the floor. We decide for next year. And you would decide for next year. So it wouldn't be an Australian ballot this, this year. To complicate matters, and I'm not sure the best time to bring this up, if I should bring it up now or if I should bring it up under the next article, it sort of applies to both. The, legisl the emergency legislation that had been in effect for the past two years for our town meeting um, expired on Sunday. So that's no longer in place. Today, we have to go back to traditional town meeting. There is pending legislation that uh, passed in the House today and is now moving to the Senate tomorrow. They're speed tracking it and they're hoping that it will pass and be signed into effect by Friday that would give another year. If so, the board would have the power to um, change the date and switch everything to Australian ballot again for this this year. Is it the Act 1? Or it is. It was Act 1. It's age 42 this yep. year. Yeah. And so that gives us choice. That would give you the choice. That is a choice by just the select board. If if this passes, it's enabling. You could choose to remain on the floor. You could choose to um, switch to Australian ballot, or you could choose what the village has done the past two years, do a floor vote, but move it to a later date. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of need a read on the situation because it's two very different paths. And um, I need to, if there's any indication that you would want to move to Australian ballot, I might need to get order more supplies and different things than if we're going to stick to the floor. It's a different path, yeah. yeah. Um, I, thank you for explaining that. I, I understood it, but it was it's really nice to have everybody sort of be on the same page and understand what that means. Um, if in the event that does happen, the traditional town meeting goes away, is that not true? So if there are three separate articles and all three would have to pass independently, right. so it could um, just hypothetically, if you choose to put um, all three articles about the Australian bat moving to the Australian ballot on um, the warning and we have a floor vote, then um, the voters would have to approve articles, budget and officers. If they choose just officers and just articles, then we would only go and have the budget at 
um, floor meeting if they if the voters vote that down right. um, they could choose just the budget and they could leave officers and articles um, on floor vote that's what the school does I will tell you that there's 12 to 20 people that attend the school the floor portion of the school meeting um, and that's between Stowe and Elmore and Morristown um, now that the budget is on um, Australian ballot, the, the participation is, is a lot, lot less. If it's, There's a lot of decisions to make. So if the, the pending H42 passes this week and you decide that you want to move to all Australian ballot for this town meeting, um, you couldn't vote on these articles because they can't be voted on by Australian ballot. They would have to be voted on next year or at a special um, town floor meeting in the future because they have to be voted on by the floor. Complicated. Could you explain yeah. that one more time? So <laughs> it's all hypothetical right now. So if H42 passes this emergency enabling legislation and the board decides that you want to have all Australian ballot this year, you cannot have these three articles on it to move to Australian ballot because you cannot vote in an Australian ballot to move to Australian ballot. There has to be a floor vote to allow for the conversation and the dialogue. So the hat's tipped, right? I don't know what you mean. It's, it's rigged. No, 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 the, the, yeah, yeah, it just say it's, rigged. it's, it's, uh, it's to give power to the people and um, give everybody a chance <clears throat> with their, their voice. If they want a chance, they got to be here tonight. So you, so if those two things were the cases, you would either have to wait one more year and, and vote next year on the floor mm -hmm. and or hold a special meeting in between the two. So you're looking for feeling from all the board members how we feel about it i'm looking for a feeling on that and i'm looking for a feeling mm -hmm. on um the articles on the warning if there's anything you want to yeah. change add remove the only comment Question? i have about the articles is that we've talked about this before is article 16 where um, the appropriations for the multiple um, organizations and you know, you have to vote all or none. And um, it would be nice if you didn't have to vote all or none, if you could, you know, dive into that somehow. I know that's very complicated. We have to have, you know, an article on each one perhaps or something like that. But I've gotten a lot of feedback about that, that, you know, it doesn't, see, doesn't feel right to be voting all or none when there's some you approve of and some you don't. And I'm sure that's the case for, for a lot of people feel. So that's currently based on your policy. So you have a policy how you're going to treat the, um, the those questions, those yeah. articles. You could choose to. You have the power to change that policy and make them all individual. Yeah, I would. And like I've to do seen that. both ways um, with Australian ballot. I've seen both ways floor votes where it's either all lumped in or it's all broken mm -hmm. down. But but that's you have the power to change that. Yeah. With your policy. That's good to know. Haven't we voted during town meeting to um, allocate more money to different From the floor. Yeah. It happens a lot. The yeah. memorial or the food share, it's happened. Right. It, ra it was raised a lot, several times on the floor in the past. So you can vote to add or subtract, and then you vote on the whole thing. So what's the difference? You, um, if it were, if you were to move to all Australian ballot, you couldn't do that. You couldn't do it, yeah. Oh, you couldn't. Like, the, budget, the, budget could also, so the budget, the budget also. So the budget you can move to make changes. Right. Gotcha. That's yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why I thought that in the past, and I'm like, really thinking now. If it goes to Australian ballot. It's you know, you live with it, whatever it is. So I'm just sort of preparing that. I thought about this for many years, going to Australian mm -hmm. ballot, but. You know, just because it's kind of disturbing that 200 people decide on an $8 million budget, you know, but that's the way it's been. I'm not saying I advocate for that. I think the more people that can vote, the better on it, you know, so. I'd be interested in, I don't know how to do this, but I'd be interested instead of doing an all or nothing Australian ballot or town meeting, 
So our starting ballot gets rid of town meeting totally. And I'd like to see us look at possibly changing the date of town meeting and or the time of day so that more people would be available. I'd like to be able to put that out to the voters before we do an all or nothing. So I'm not quite sure how to proceed with that. Were you saying that we don't necessarily have to do or not, nothing that we could do just budget at town meeting and vote for officers and articles on a showing ballot or any combination of those? Whichever one we wanted to, but if we did all three, then town meeting would go away. And what you're doing is just putting it on the warning for the voters to vote what right. they want. Right. right. There's <clears throat> only any other business to come before the meeting card. Right. Would that go away too? It yeah. would, and VLCT would recommend that we don't have it anyways. Right. We put it on sort of like the community concerns because we think it's, well, I saying we but I'm t totally guessing that it's the best interest to get the voice of our citizens but we're strongly recommended by VLCT and the attorneys not to do it yeah. Don what do you think about this do you have any questions or comments yeah I have some thoughts on this um I guess the first one and it uh, Sarah you alluded to it a couple of times so January 30th is kind of our our, our drop dead date to make decisions on this warning is that correct yes um personally i'm in favor of i'm certainly in favor of putting the budget on the ballot and if in fact h42 does pass this week then i would certainly um, move in that direction i i like the rest of you i'm very concerned about the fact that less than 200 people are voting on a, a budget of this size and that's happened at the last meeting we we talked about the last seven years and uh, it's been barely 200 people at best and so i think putting the budget on the australian ballot would be um would be uh, appropriate for us to do if if in fact h42 passes if it doesn't pass then uh it sounds like we don't really have too much choice another question and i think Sarah, I just want to be clear on this. In terms, you talked about the three uh, articles that must be voted from the floor, and they are number one to vote on the budget, number I believe, and number two, the date of the town meeting and and the time of the town meeting. But those aren't connected in any way. We could we can choose one of those and not the other two. Is that correct, or do we have to do all three? Well, I presented five different ones just on feedback back that I've gotten from community members and select board members. They were curious. Um, yeah, you can pick or choose any or all. Well, it sounds like either this year, I guess this is what I'm leaning towards. If, if H42 does pass, then we would vote on those articles next year. If in fact, we don't have a, a floor town meeting. Um, but regardless, and if 842 doesn't pass, then I would suggest we put articles out there on the floor this year to consider voting on the budget by Australian ballot in the future. Brian? Well, I think we ought to wait till next year because I think we're all going to be confused here. You're picking one of five, two of five. It's all going to be messed up. I think we ought to get our ducks in a row next year, get everything we want done, and have it ready for next year. That's my opinion. I just think the time, whether you can even get it done, because you've got to get more supplies, I, I just think it's time to wait. I'm not against doing it. I just think get our ducks in a row and get it done right the first time. So you're suggesting we have <coughs> with a town meeting? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Just like what's here now, you have your regular budget here, and then the town meeting has their... Because if this doesn't pass, that's where we're going to have it, right? Yeah. If, if, the, if H42 doesn't pass, the, this or something very similar would you would have this right. but you could also add these yeah. five 
any of these five, five so we're, articles. We're hoping that you guys are wondering if it's going up. If we wait and do it next year, we'll have it all ready and we'll know for the whole year how to perform. You have, you have a year to work on it, that's what you're saying. That's my opinion. And then it would go in effect a year after that. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I, I just think that I know everybody's worried about only 200 people, but get out there. Any one of these people can call here, get a ballot. They can come to the meeting if they can. They can go online. There's a lot of ways to do it. Yeah. Well, okay. you can't get a ballot to vote at town meeting if you're, no. you have to be in person at town meeting. But you can get your ballots that are here. What I'm saying is about. Right. The well, you if H42 does not pass, presently the only article, there's only one article on the ballot that you could request the ballot for, and that's electing a select, two select board members. Separate. Everything else currently will be on the floor. That you can't get a ballot for. So do we have to make a decision tonight? You have to give us some, you're going to sign it on the 30th. If you want us to bring you a draft that you're going to sign and or you're going to um, discuss it then and have to wait for us to go make additions and print it during your meeting. It absolutely has to be signed on the 30th. Yeah. Um, and then I'm sorry. I'm still throwing this out in my mind. It's, um, a, it's in their different yeah. subjects, and I'm sorry to throw them all at once. I just wanted you to have yeah. all of it, but yeah. there's it's a lot of if that, then, then. So if, um, and then there's a, the, the possible situation where if the, um, if the petition comes through, what, what are they, can you remind me what they're asking for? Just the budget. They're asking if the budget be voted for um, the Australian ballot. So the correct only thing, me if I'm wrong. The, the, yes, but it, you would vote it. It's the way it stands right now. You would vote on whether the budget went on the Australian ballot at this coming uh, town meeting, mm -hmm. which then would go into effect but next year. Okay. And that's what Brian's saying. Well, if we wait till next year to do it, then you won't <laughs> have it on it. The Australian value until the year, year after. after. So we can't, okay. this is the time to do it if you want to do it. So, the one, so, yeah, so the one action that the select board could take, regardless of if H42 passes, is we could, we could, um, we could say, um, put, it, put an article on the floor during town meeting to vote on whether we can put the budget on. A ballot is that correct? Is it you can any of these five? So the budget, okay. Yeah. Okay. the the officers, the public questions, the town. This is all you can put on right now, regardless, regardless of H H forty two. If H forty two passes okay. and you move to Australian ballot, then the then those all have to just be removed. But okay. you can't okay. you can't put them on if it's Australian ballot this year. You can put them on the, if it's a floor vote, which currently it is a floor vote. And when is the vote? When is the vote for they're going to decide in 42? It passed the House today. It's mm -hmm. moving to the Senate tomorrow. So, so it depends may, on. Uh, I have the email. You may have that answer within a day or two. They're Maybe. hoping Friday, but then I don't know if it has to go to the governor. And, um, I'm sure probably will not says it has been passed the House, sent to the Senate. I'm meeting, this is the, the clerk, Senate Gov Ops tomorrow afternoon with the hopes that the committee will pass it and bring it to the floor on Thursday. Fingers crossed it'll pass by the end of the week. It would be nice to have that decision before we make a decision. Right, because then, right, so the only thing that would be on the ballot it's more would be clear. just the officers, the select board. Yes. Well, if I think we can make a decision tonight um, based upon the two scenarios. Right. So again, I'm just going to say if, if H42 doesn't pass, then we're going to have town meeting, traditional town meeting. And we're going to vote on the budget on the floor. But I would suggest we put these articles in place for future town meetings. <laughs> if H42 does pass, then I would, I'm just going to say again, I think it's really important that 
we have a ballot that allows as many people as possible to vote on this budget. This is a really important budget this year. It's probably the most important budget for, for all of us that have lived in Morrisville for 30, 40 years at least. And it certainly is for me. I, I, I just feel really strongly about it. I think uh, if we can get this budget vote on a ballot, we need to do it. Thank you, Don. Yeah, I agree with you, Don. Yeah. yeah. Well, what, what would be the what would be the problem of moving the time of the town meeting rather than having it during the morning or the afternoon to move it to an evening? And does that have, take any votes to move it to that, so that yeah. more people can uh, attend? It all get worse. Let me let me stop you guys for a minute, please. <coughs> um, I didn't say in the beginning of the meeting, but please raise your hand. And if you need to, come, in, come and get in line behind the microphone. The folks that are listening to this online can't hear you if you're just speaking out, especially if you have a mask on. Uh, I, it was very muffled for me what you said. So, But I want to lay the ground rules. Please be respectful. Raise your hand. I'll call on you. You come up, introduce yourself, where you're from, and state your question or your comment. Please, instead of these outbursts, because I, I want to keep it under order. We've got a lot of people in the room here. And it's important we do that. Thank you. I will. I will say that the how it reads is the town may move to. For, this is the changing of the date. You can um, start at any three days immediately preceding the first Tuesday in March. So that gives you Saturday, Sunday, Monday. the The school does Monday. So. You couldn't do Monday. So that gives you, if you change the date, you can do the Saturday before or the Sunday before. And not, you couldn't do it Tuesday night. I don't think you can do it Tuesday night because we already vote some things by Australian ballot. And um, I have to be here to close the polls. I can't do both. Okay. All right. So where are we, where are we at? Where do you move? What do you want from us? Do you want us to vote on how we do it? So if I guess I just want you to vote. Do you want to add any of these? Let's let's ignore H. Let's ignore that we're going to be Australian ballot. Let's let's for now. make a um, decision based on we're staying a floor meeting because right now that's what we are. That's the law. It could could not change. Do you want to add any of these five articles to the warning and or change anything on the draft warning? I'd like to add, change the date of the town meeting. Does that also mean that we could change the time? Yes. Is that in, implied in that? Or does that no, mean? it's the second one. Uh, it's the last one. Okay, so I'd like both of those. And what are you proposing, first, second, or third day? Saturday. And what time? I'd say six, five, maybe five. I don't know. Any other thoughts? I don't know about time. But I would agree with you, Judy, on that. It takes into, uh, I think, religious considerations, too, because mm -hmm. we have uh, yes. the Sabbath. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I would need to do some research, but I think historically when people have moved it to Saturday, they've moved it to like 9 or 10 in the morning, That's what I thought not about. Saturday evenings. Okay. I don't envision turnout being good we, on a Saturday that, afternoon. Do we have to be that specific now, or we can just say, say change the date and change the time? No, you have to, have to be that specific. You have to be that specific. Yeah, I would say Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. That's a good. I think we get a lot more people. How about you, Jess? Um, I know being on a school schedule that I get town meeting off, and all your current players who gave me time off to attend a town meeting. Um, I know there's, I know a lot of folks who work in the tourist industry and they work on weekends. So I, I'm personally, it doesn't work for me. I mean, I'll make it work, but um, I think it would, I think it affect a lot of people 
adversely to already get that time off. Um, and also, um, yeah, I don't, I, I'm not a big fan of, I don't know how to, um, I don't know how to measure the data around, you know, who could show up and who that would work for. The data speaks that it's only 200 people at town meeting. <laughs> the well, current time doesn't think, work well. Well, that's not, I mean, that's not a scientific study. Um, like, I, there. It's a historical one, though. It's an historical one, but there's so many factors that can contribute to that. Yeah. Um, you know, just people feeling disenfranchised or not interested, or like nothing is up for vote that matters to them, or, you know. Um, I don't I, I think, I don't think it's scientific. It is certainly, um, you know, you observe that. Damn um, <coughs> Excuse me? Damn G. A couple of hands up. Yeah, I was just pulling the the board first, and then we'll ask, ask, what do you say, Brian? So I'm not in favor of that. I work Saturday, so. Okay. Not that you need to, Yeah. you know, I can be one that's not here. Then. Yeah. How about you, Don? I can, I can do it. Um, I could go for it. The only thing I would say is, first of all, I'd say seven years in a row of data is, you know, that's pretty consistent, is, some, is somewhat of a trend. I think it's, it's telling. If we went to Saturday morning, I have no idea how many people would show up. Um, but I do know other towns have changed their town meetings to other days and have not seen a significant difference in the number of people that are showing up. I, I think I hate to say it. I just think the, the days of, you know, 800 people, 600 people showing up to town meeting are, are behind us. But I could go for Saturday. I could go for Saturday at 10 o'clock. I'm, I'm just going to reiterate what I said before. I think the important thing is voting on the voting on the budget by ballot. I think we need to make sure that that's on there. Also, um, there like in terms of the school schedule, um, students are all on um, winter break. So winter break and it counts back from the Tuesday of um, of town meeting, so most families are away, away that weekend. I mean, um, and and then make sure that they come back to the Monday. So I would think if we change town meeting, then the school vacation, those two days of school vacation, would probably go away. Yeah. Yep. Big deal. I have been told. I don't have you know data in hand but towns that have moved to change it to a different date and time that um traditionally the turnout has even gotten worse just to let you know we got a couple of questions on zoom so hands up yes if i may ask uh, two questions uh it seems like uh everyone uh, in the meeting in person and that I'm reading on on uh, Front Porch Forum is in agreement that it would be best for voter participation to have the uh, uh, decision on the ballot uh, be done by Australian ballot. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's I haven't heard a lot of uh, dissent about that. Um, I listened to the complications about how that is to be brought about. And frankly, I kind of lost track of them early on, all the details of that. So I'm simply going to ask, what has to happen to ensure that the vote on the budget that we're looking at coming up now, the one that's relevant to us right now, uh, is decided by Australian ballot? And to add to that, uh, that that be done as a as a mail-in ballot by option, since we also know that we increase participation considerably. So with listening to the experts, whoever knows the ins and outs of this, how do we ensure that uh, the vote on the budget be done by Australian ballot with the option of, of a vote in balance? That's my question. Yep. So the only way to ensure that um, this year's budget is by Australian ballot is to ask your senator to vote it and the governor to sign this emergency legislation. And then the select board would have to, after that vote, to, to be Australian ballot this one year. Would that apply to the upcoming vote in March? If yes, it's all pending on this le this legislation passing. 
And and then the second half of the question, uh, how do we allow that uh, allow mail-in ballots to be used in that case? That's our next uh, um, agenda item for tonight. Good. There you go. Thanks. Remind the folks in Zoom to please introduce yourself as well. I, I know you, Ed, but um, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ed Lowenton. Thank you. And I'm puzzled. Uh, could the select board not simply decide as our governing town body to say we're going to have it by Australian ballot this year and that's it? No. 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 The power is with the voters and the enabling legislation is actually taking the power away from the voters and putting it in the hands of the select board for one time only due to the pandemic. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is there another question on Zoom? Somebody had their hand up. Go ahead, sir. Introduce yourself, please. You unmute. I can't hear you. Uh, okay, uh, David Ring. Sorry about that. Hey, David. I, um, I guess we've had a lot of discussion, and I don't know if you could answer this or someone could answer this. But at this point, what is the validity of the petition that is circulating for this uh, vote by Australian ballot? Could someone answer that? And in in relation to uh, this, uh, this Act uh, Forty Two thing, or or relative to that, or whatever. You can answer that. Well, it hasn't been turned in yet, so until it's in my hands officially, I can't really say if it's um, valid. Valid. Give us the whatever happens, uh, either or, one way or the other. Give us the scenario. So, if if it has five percent of the registered voters, um, then it will automatically be put on the warning. If it. Does and it's here Thursday by four o'clock. If it doesn't, if it doesn't, then um, it's not going to be on the warning unless the select board votes to put it on, anyways. And would that, if it was on the warning, would that force the issue of having a vote by Australian ballot on the budget if it was on the warning, like you just said? Would it force a vote? If it's on the warning and, and we have a floor meeting, then yes, the voters would vote on it this town meeting. By Australian ballot, by Australian no. ballot. No, you can never vote on it by Australian ballot. From the floor. Okay. It always has to be a floor vote. Okay. I thought that, I thought that that's what the, this petition was for, was to get it by Australian ballot. <laughs> But you can't vote to get it on Australian ballot by voting by, on Australian ballot. It, it's, vote on the floor. It's, yeah, it's to vote all current, all future after this election. After this one. Okay, after this one. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. What's next? Um, no, we're, we have to. So, you're, you, so Judy said that you're, you're for changing the time. And is that the only article that you wanted to add? The day, like the only, day and time. The day and time. Okay. And that's the only thing you wanted to add? Yeah. Okay. Um, and you're taking a poll of all of us? Yes. Of, of things that we'd like to add. Okay. So I'd like to add um, using Australia ballot, Australian ballot to vote for budget articles. Um, I would like to add that. And we already use Australian ballot to no, you don't. So you only oh. you only do select board member, but um, town clerk, town treasurer, lister, trustee of public funds, and library trustee. So that's what right. if but you if you move to Australian ballot and the voters vote to um, adopt it, then you would be coming to town meeting to vote on those one, two, three, four, five, and five officers and then the other um, non-budget items whatever they would be from year to year would that be with the appropriations going you know I, I don't know i was wondering that if that's considered part of the budget or not and is it would it be like uh, raising the taxes to equal one cent that would be on the budget i mean that would be on the ballot i think so but i would uh, i would ask um our attorney to, to, to which of these to which of these are would, would still be considered um, but you know budget if all the money articles are considered budget or not so an example of one that I can 
find for sure that would be on it would be um, the dates that you're going to collect taxes that have been set forever in that way, but we vote on it yearly. And that would be on the from the floor or the back? The floor. The floor. So I know you would, if you vote just to move the budget and not the other, you would come for five um, officers and you would come for um, the date of the taxes. You may be coming for some of these um, money articles, but I'm not sure. So I would, I would, my feeling is that I would like to um, use Australian ballot to elect officers and to use it for budget articles, because we're already using the Australian ballot to vote for officers. Some. Some officers. Who are, who, what town officers clerk. Town clerk happens at town meeting. Yep. Oh, okay. I town treasurer. Okay. Okay. Lister. Okay. Um, oh. No, we no longer. That's now appointed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There used to be a whole long list. It's down yeah. to only five. Yeah. Town clerk, really town treasurer, that. Lister, trustee of public funds, and library trustees. I didn't realize that was at town meeting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tony, you have a question. You want to come up here? Yeah. You, don't, you don't speak loud enough. You've got you to make sure everybody can hear you. <laughs> so, Johnny Kelly from Morristown, and instead of 200 people voting on this biggest budget in Morristown this year, why can't Sarah write to the senator, like you just said, and ask if we, the people of Morristown, can vote Australian ballot this year and stop all the BS? That's all I'm asking. Because you got a lot of BS right there. Not your fault. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. So Sarah, I'm still I'm still confused now. For this, sure. This is <laughs> it is confusing. Um, just and there's all these five that you have listed here. So it would it would seem ridiculous for us to have a town meeting for like two or three items. If we think we have a low attendance now, we'll have like no money then. So to me it seems like it's either all or nothing in the future. I what I've learned from other towns is that if you move the budget off the floor vote yeah. and you move it to Australian ballot, you might as well move everything because the attendance is is next to nothing. Yeah. Nothing. So I think that that's the bigger debate. Do you leave things as are and promote people to come to town meeting? Do you move everything to Australian ballot and do away with traditional town meeting? Or do you move the date of town meeting in hopes that more people will come? I think is really yeah. simplified yeah. version. I would, I would agree. Yeah. yeah, we could move the day or date and then see if it made any difference. If it didn't, then we could move it to all Australian ballot and it would go away. Yeah, I think attempting to make some kind of change um, to, to increase attendance. To see if would, it does. Yeah, it would be my desire first before <clears throat> abolishing the whole thing. Yeah, me as well. Bob, you have two hands right now, so. Ed, go ahead. Nope. You got your hand up on the screen. Uh, you? Yes, I was just looking for the button to turn it off. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> David, you got a question. I guess. Did I do it right this time? Or did I lose it? Almost. Oh, now you're muted. <laughs> okay. Uh, can't you, can't you come can't you combine the wanting to do the Australian ballot and having it done at the time of town meeting, like Tuesday at 10 o'clock, have the Australian ballot, combine it to bring people to a, to a town meeting and have the Australian ballot at that time, rather than, I think, by mail it by mail or something? Can't you do it that way? That's what we do right now. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with it? <laughs> maybe nothing maybe something it depends on your opinion 
it sounds great to me to keep it going the way it was, even though we don't have the attendance, we try and get better attendance. That's all with, with a budget like we've got, with the money we're talking, we should have a pretty darn good attendance this year. Thanks, David. Sir, you have your hand up, but do you really have your hand up or? Dennis. Oh, right. uh, this is Dennis Nephew. Uh, yeah, you have to. Oh, Dennis, I didn't recognize you on Zoom there. Oh, the Dennis Nephew in Morrisville. Um, and I'm sorry I came a little bit late, but I'm a little confused as to what we can actually, or what are we even trying to decide at this moment? And because there's the question of, do we abolish town meeting altogether at some point in the future? But I don't think we're doing that for March, maybe next year. And the school district is not gonna change their calendar for this school year, because they can't. So, uh, sounds like town meeting happens no matter what this year. What are we trying to accomplish with this decision right now is my question. I think it's just, do we put the budget on Australian ballot, which we can't do until the, the Senate says we can. So what are we actually trying to decide? We're trying to decide what we put on the warning for the people to vote on in March of this year that will affect next year. Thank you. Does that, that make sense? Yeah. That sure has nothing to do with it. So the warning is given out before town meeting or given, or it's what they're voting on at town uh, meeting? For, you, can, you can pick up a, your, town, your uh, report. report ahead of time, which will have okay. the warning in it. Okay, so that has to be published before town meeting, and they'll be voting on what happens next year. But for this year's town meeting and whether this year's budget goes on an Australian budget, that's that H42 thing. That's correct. correct. So we can't decide that right now anyway. Right. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Tom. Yeah. I'd like, I'd like to just talk about the, uh, the budget again on the Australian ballot. That's got to be done at town meeting. So we're not trying to get rid of town meeting uh, for this year. That I has got, to, I, I never <coughs> heard say that. Right. Right, okay. Uh, You're so just making it clear for everybody that that's. That's what that is. Right. And there's not, the budget is, unless, now that it, it's complicated, unless the, the legislature says we can, then you can allow it to on the Australian budget. And as far as getting people to go, the figures here, they're not going to go away. They go back to 2016 when 148 people came. And in 2017, 242 people showed up. Now, there are five, $6,000 budgets at that time. And in 2018, million. Million yeah, million, yeah. Yeah, excuse me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I did a little difference. <laughs> a little larger. Almost as large as the eight million would be. All right, and then the two, uh, 2018 was 163 people. 2019, 158 people. I mean, there's a, there's, a, a, it's telling us that people don't want to go or cannot go. I think it's more like they cannot go to the town meeting. So whatever you're going to do, I don't think it's going to change that number enough to make to make 35 percent. Uh, that we're looking for, for the people to vote on these budgets. This is a big budget. And plus all the other things that are on those articles are important to a lot of people that live in this town. And to put it off next year to next year is just not the way to do business for this town. And I hope that you at least do that. And then we'll talk later about how much uh, it costs to send the ballots out to get the people all the people in this town to have a say on what's going on. Thanks, so, Tom. Thank you. Lori, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Lori Streets. Um, I do digital marketing, and as much as everyone hates digital here, I just think that there is a sentiment. Uh, well, true. Um, I think there's a, um, an emotional, sentimental, um, attachment to town meeting because of the tradition. Um, I understand that. You look at 2016 when 146, 
most of the people at that time living in Morrisville were from Morrisville. We're now 2023, huge development, a lot of out of town people. I moved here 23 years ago. I'd never heard of town meetings. They didn't happen in any towns I ever lived in. So I, I think we're delaying the inevitable. Um, I think the pandemic has pushed everyone to the internet. You talk to businesses, that ever, all that business that went to the internet, very little of it's coming back. Our retailers are hurting because people like the convenience. Um, we are, again, with this development, we have a lot of people who are coming in who are working. A lot of the tourist industry are moving here because they can't afford to live anywhere else. I think you will only confuse things by moving it, and I appreciate the, the value of trying to save it, but I think we're just delaying and adding confusion, and it's going to do nothing but frustrate the voters. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Laura. All right. Thank you. What do you need from us, Sarah? <laughs> Straw poll. Am I just adding the changing of the um, date and time? Jess had mentioned the, yeah, the budget. budget. Too. I'm not in favor of changing the date and time, but I'm not number correct. And another is Brian, right? Okay. And Don, you're in favor of changing the date and time? I, I'm in change. Yeah, I, I'm. I guess I'm in favor of doing it. I'm not sure what difference. It, I, I I don't feel strongly that's going to make a difference. I I think Laura's comments are well taken. It's inevitable. I think what's important is figuring a way to get as many people to vote on this budget as possible. Sarah, Sarah, can I ask one other question? And that is, and I hate to confuse this, but if H42 passes, we can vote on the budget by ballot, but can we then have just a normal town meeting as well? Oh, great question. Uh, uh, yeah, um, hold on. I don't know. Just says apply the Australian ballot system. Any such vote shall also apply the Australian ballot method of voting to any vote that occurs as a result of the annual meeting, um, such as the budget. Um, I think it's all. It's all based on COVID, right? So. Yeah, I think it's everything. So, I mean, everything from, everything on the morning would go on the ballot. Is that what you're saying? Okay. If you voted that. If, if you, you voted. follow the legislation. Yeah. I guess, Bob, what I would like to see us do right now is have two straw vote, votes, one if H42 passes and one if it does not. Yeah, we can do that. <clears throat> and what are you voting on? <coughs> Question. 42 passes, as I've said, that the budget um, and all, I guess all other matters have to be on the ballot. Right. Do we, do we have a choice if H42 passes? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. That's what it gives us a choice to do. It does give us a choice. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If H42 doesn't pass, then the budget clearly can't be on the ballot. We know that. And then we're going to consider these other articles that we've, that we've been talking about, changing the date, changing the time, and deciding whether or not to have an Australian ballot in the future for electing officers in the budget. So, okay. so, the, so we're saying if H42 passes, would we, would we vote <coughs> the budget on the, on the ballot? Okay. I would. Yes. Yes. I think it's more would you want to move to all Australian ballot for this right. year? Oh, yeah. for this year. Yeah, I, because I'm pretty sure it's all or nothing. Oh, okay. yeah. And then this whole hour long discussion becomes moot and for next year right. and or a special meeting before next year. So it, with the maybe. so the petitions coming out would go on the ballot too. I have to I have to double check with VLCT but my what I think would happen because this is enabling emergency legislation so depending on how it reads if I get a petition by Thursday to move to Australian ballot um, for the budget, I but we couldn't vote on it by Australian ballot. I don't know if that would trigger a special election because I received a petition. I forgot about that. Yeah. So what are your yeah? There's vote? a lot of 
How do you feel? What am I voting on? <laughs> Whether to have the budget on a string on ballot, ballot if H-42 okay. passes. I'd, I'd like to stay with the town meeting. Okay. Jess? If H-42 passes, I would like the budget on the ballot. But we, have, but that, then that's all or nothing, correct? Right. No mm -hmm. town meeting. Right. I'll, I'm going to vote for that. Brian? I'm going to abstain because I don't know what we're going on. Okay. And Don? So mixed up. If H-42 passes, I would like to see the budget on the ballot, and I guess all other matters. And I agree with Don. Okay. Okay. So it's getting late. This is the first article. I think my advice would be let's wait and see if H-42 passes. And... Um, just plan that um, June, January 30th might be a working select board meeting where we're going to bring this discussion up again once we know whether or not it's there and you can figure out and we can add and remove articles before you sign it. Okay. Good. Is January 30th a scheduled select board meeting or it's a special one? It's a special one because of um, signing the warning. That's a statutory time you have to sign so, the warning. Yeah. So when's the deadline for you to be able to get ballots and everything printed? Well, um, pe candidate petitions are due January 30th at 5. I will be open till 5 on that day. Um, and then, um, sorry, I'm tired from being up here. Um, I forget if it's 24 or 48 hours if the petition is non-conforming. -con I think they have till Wednesday to fix anything and or decide to withdraw if they want to. So I think I can order ballots on that Thursday. This is the second. Okay. okay. Where does the budget for this year going on to on Australian ballot stand? Are you going to do that if this uh, if it passes? Yes. Yes. What if it doesn't pass? We're going to figure that out on January 30th. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Because I'm not positive have we'll have 5%. You know, I don't know how many number. I know we got, we're close, but I don't know if we're going to have yeah. the right number. Yeah. But we can and, decide that then. Okay. Even if we don't have it. Okay. Is there somebody? Oh, yeah. I didn't see him. Come on up here. John. Hi, uh, Bob Bortry. I live on Randolph Road. Uh, my question is, if H-42 passes, are you going to mail out ballots, or are people going to have to go to town meeting to vote via Australian that's, ballot? That's, that's, that's the next number, item number. on our okay, agenda. Okay, because otherwise it seems a moot point if we're getting... You know, if we're not getting the participation in town meeting, yeah. what would be the point of this whole charade? Yeah. <laughs> right. We'll get to it. If we can get to this next number two item, we'll decide. <laughs> Anything else, Sarah? So I know you're really confused. Thank you for weeding through all of that. Any, um, anything on the listed articles? It's at number 16. I don't know. I don't want to complicate it with that, but I've had a lot of feedback about that. Article 16. You know, a lot of people feel very strongly about it, and I do as well. I look. I look at Article 16 as every single, every single appropriation benefits somebody in our community, and most of. I think all of these articles are. They're all nonprofit, and they're also. Um, in in our in our county and i think they're a valuable contributor to the health welfare um, of our citizens so i i strongly support them as is as is as one them go ahead christy one yes okay christy smith um is there any way to keep the list of the appropriations as is and have to vote on it as is without allowing people to change it on the floor? I think it would be Sarah, if, if Sarah it goes away. No. Right? I don't think no. so. Because, I mean, I've been at the town meetings where people ask for, you know, big increases and in what they asked for. And uh, 
don't yeah, know. 2,500 to 10,000 almost. Yeah, right. and then you have to vote, and then it's all or nothing. Laura, come on. Just real quick, it requires a charter of governance to make that kind of altercation to the, uh, any of the things. Right now, we're obligated to go by the state statutes. Right, a charter change. Mm -hmm. Anything else there? I don't That's think enough. That's good enough, too. <laughs> I knew it would be. This will probably only an hour, actually. Do you need me for the second, the next one? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Stay right up there. You want a chair? <laughs> no. No, thank you. So I have a quick question, though. Okay. So if we go with the ballot this year, that on the ballot, then the ballot that they're the petition that they're getting is not any good. They can't vote on it, right? On a ballot. If you move to Australian ballot this year. <coughs> Um, and they turn in a petition, I would need to check and see if um, that would trigger a special meeting. That's what, that that's what, town meeting. that's what I think. Yeah, okay. That would be a floor vote, just oh. on that petition. Yeah. Okay. All right, so number two, discuss mailing ballots for March 7th, 2023 annual town meeting. This is a request from a community member. Yeah. Um, so, I know that the that select board has the power to um, vote to mail everybody. <coughs> I know it's extra work for our town clerk's office to mail all these ballots out to everyone. And can you tell us what the cost is associated with? Mm -hmm. um, first, assuming that H42 doesn't pass and we're all for <coughs> vote, the only thing that will be on the ballot is the two select board members. Um, so roughly mailing all registered voter their ballots with return postage is a little over 11,000 <coughs> mailing all voters um, their ballots without return postage is um, about wait Did you the first one 11,000 is mailing it with return postage um, Ma this um, mailing all voters ballots without return postage is about 9,000 and um, mailing roughly 300 people which is um, an inflated guess of how many people actually request them is about three so anybody can request <coughs> at any time so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the difference in the cost is obviously the postage, and the postage has gone up from last year. The, um, and then the ballots, it costs more to buy ballots. Everything costs more than it did before. Um, and uh, the state used to provide all the envelopes, all the certificate, the inside, the outside, there's three envelopes involved, and they no longer provide those. They cut their costs and transferred it all to the town. And this is assuming that <coughs> 42 does not pass. If it, I think the request sense. was regardless if it passes or not. Okay. And but I, it didn't come to me. I but don't know. If, um, if it, is there a contingency, is there, um, which is the scenario where <coughs> we have to send ballots? Is there a contingency? No, there isn't. Okay. No. <coughs> it's a select board decision. And, and the select board also gets to decide if the school does or not. And you, um, because the school would be, the school um, vote would be in that same envelope. Yes. Um, and what are the, do you have, I know we've asked this a million times, do you have the numbers um, for the voter turnout um, based on um, mailing ballots versus not mailing ballots? Not with me. Okay. It's it's a lot it's, greater. It's, it's significant. significantly we greater. Thirty-eight percent turnout with mail out ballots versus what? Like I feel like well, I want to say four, but that yeah. might be um, <coughs> turnout there. It's very it's very low. Yeah. I I was gonna say I think Tom I think probably Tom has them. Yeah. <laughs> All right. In two thousand two thousand sixteen, uh, with the uh, requested ballot. It was 25 percent and it was a high uh, request for that year because i think there was somebody running for office and, and but anyway 
In 2017, it was 13% that voted. And in 2018, 13% again. 2019, 13% again. In 2020, they were mailed out, it jumped to 26%. 2021, where they were mailed out, it jumped to 35%. In 2022, where they had the special meeting, it jumped to 44%. And in the primary election, where they were not mailed out, they were asked, it was 25%. And on the general election that we had last year, mailed out ballots, it was 61%. So what you're looking for is, do you want 13% of the people deciding on what, whatever you want on that ballot? Or do you want the 35% to 61%? And how much? How much does democracy <coughs> cost? Does it cost $9,000 or $3,000 or $11,000? How much are you willing to put in so the people in Morrisville get their chance to vote? So it's up to you. Thank Bonnie, you had a. Um, Bonnie, the microphone. Cut the microphone. I can't hear you unless you do. I have to hear you on Zoom that way. You're not recording, too. Bonnie Griswold, and I just wanted to um, say I used to work at Johnson State College and did bulk mailings all the time, and there is a way to send those out that you are only charged return postage if the person returns the ballot. So if 50% of the ballots that you send out never come back, there is a way to not have to pay postage on those. I've forgotten exactly what it's called, but it would definitely be worth looking into. But I agree with you. I don't care what it costs. I think we should be um, mailing out ballots and we should be making this size uh, vote our size money vote um, by the largest number of voters possible. I looked around in, in here and I think I might be the oldest person here. I have gone to town meetings since I was 21 and able to vote. And I agree with Laura, there's a whole lot of tradition involved in town meetings. But I think more than the tradition, town meetings stand for information. And it's, that's the one time of the year that I even feel like I can get information. I have struggled for a year to do what these folks are doing and Zoom these meetings. And I wear hearing aids and I never could hear on Zoom. And I couldn't come, I didn't feel like I could come to, to even mass to come to the meetings. And so I think that all of us need all the information we can get and have felt for about two years that I didn't have information. Prior to that, any time I voted, I knew what I was voting for and why. And I, I'd like to feel that way again. Thanks, Bob. <clears throat> Bob, you want to come up again? Yeah, I just uh, had one question, I guess. How many registered voters do we have in Morrisville? About 40, a little over 4,200. So we're talking two, three dollars per voter for, for mailing a ballot? That seems like a non-issue, it really does. Uh, I, I really do hope we will consider doing that. I think it's, it's very important and for a lot of reasons, I think not just for the budget, but for people to feel engaged and have a voice in their community. And I get the sense that it's not just this issue, it's other issues where people feel like they just don't have a voice and we need to have that voice. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any other conversation about that? Judy. Bob, can I ask a question? So I think I've got these numbers straight, but it was $11,000, this is the question for Sarah, $11,000 to mail everyone a ballot with return postage. It was 9,000 to send everyone a ballot without return postage, is that correct? Yes. And then 3,000 things broke up, so I didn't know what the $3,000 was. Um, for just the people who requested the ballot. Okay, so to request. Just guessing, it was about 300. 
300 people. Okay, great. Thank you. We have two people on Zoom, Bob. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Ed, and then. Yeah. Um, that last exchange makes me wonder, how do you know, uh, how do you have much of an idea of who's going to request them? How, how, on what do you logically base the 3,000? I guess we don't need an answer for that right away, but it's an interesting question. How can you guess that? The other two numbers seem like they would be pretty certain. The other is, uh, if you really need to save the money, I think uh, you'll get the biggest incremental vote of, of, of the most concerned voters by simply really well publicizing the availability and just giving uh, one or two or more easy means uh, of communicating with the clerk's office to request them, uh, assuming that if people uh, will go to that trouble <clears throat> they will follow through and make sure to mail it in and put the few cents required to do it. And that would be your biggest incremental vote in numbers of participants. That's just a calculation uh, sort of off the cuff. If, if, if you had to save that money, other than that, would we look at this as an investment and focus in the future on what really needs to be done in the state, which is get the legislature, legislature to <coughs> all the issues that they just don't seem to get to. And the whole thing of mail-in ballots and more uniform policies might be one of them. But for the time being, that's the thought. Thanks, Ed. Dennis? Uh, yeah, thank you. This is Dennis Nephew from Morrisville again. Uh, so uh, the guy who stood up a little bit while ago got some applause. The thing is that this is just a basic function of government. You have to let the people vote. You have to make sure the ballots get into their hands. It's just the cost. I don't know why we're talking about it. But the other thing is you cannot talk about a cost without talking about what are the costs that you already have that you're not talking about. What does it cost to run town meeting? If you're talking about someday we're replacing town meeting with this, maybe it's cheaper to do it this way. I don't know, but we'd have to actually look at what does it cost to run the place before you say, oh, we can't spend money on this because it costs something that's not in the budget. There's other things in the budget we don't talk about. They need to be looked at at the same time or you're not getting a clear picture. Thanks, Dennis. Do you know, have any idea where that? We've never looked at that. The gym is free. And no, I'm trying to like, it's a great question, actually. I'm just running numbers from my head. Maybe Tina can think of stuff. But uh, at the staff time of paying VCA members to be there. Um, well, I wasn't expecting an answer. I'm just saying it has to be non-zero. The, the, it has to be something. Yeah, the, the school gives us the gym and all that for you free. Pay VCA anyway because they'd have to do ballots. Right now, I'm, right now I have two um, BCAs that I have to pay to be in two different places, but... Um, that no nope, free <coughs> I don't think there's a lot of costs actually in town meeting okay. so what do we want to do I'm not in favor of sending out ballots. I'm not in favor of sending them out either. Don? Well, Bob, here's my, here's my question. If <laughs> it all goes down to our previous conversation. If the only thing that's on the ballot are the two select board seats, I, I, I question spending $10,000 for that. Um, not that those seats that I'm looking at right now in the video aren't important, but it seems like a lot of money. But if in fact, and again, go back to H42, if on that ballot, we are voting for an $8 million budget, I think this is well spent money. Well, 
Yes, I would support mailing ballots and making sure as many people as possible vote on this. But that's really, you know, it, it's conditional. It's only if, you know, we've got everything on that ballot that we need to get responses for. I would, uh, I would certainly support spending $9,000 to mail everyone a ballot. I'm a little less certain about the return mail, but uh, yeah. I would, um, I would, uh, I'll revise my, um, my opinion to say, um, yeah, I, I don't think it's important to mail ballots if it's just two select board seats, but if it is, I'm, I'm about to send them for the budget. If the budget's on there. Well, so I want to agree with Don. If it's, if the ballot's going to be total, everything on it, I don't, I don't see $9,000 even to send it for two people being voted, okay? But if it's all on there, I would be all right with the 9,000. <coughs> Something about the um, Without me. Yeah. Because what's going to happen, I'll tell you right now, my, my home, five ballots come in, three of them get thrown away. So why send mail out ballots and the envelope that's supposed to be in the mail that gets tossed away too? What do you, what does that mean? Please explain. Because there's a guy on the that's a registered voter who doesn't vote. He didn't even know he still was on there. So he gets sent a ballot. He gets one that's going to be mailed out. He doesn't vote. Two other people aren't staying there right now. Well, so they're going to back that up. And what? 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 This is what, just anecdotal evidence about people that you know. Yeah. These are people that lived know? in my household. Oh, okay. They lived in my household. That aren't there right now, and they're going to get a ballot if you mail out everybody a ballot. Mm -hmm. So I'm all right with the 9,000 mailing everybody a ballot, but not with a mail to be sent back because that's a waste of money. But that gives everybody a chance because okay. even the guy that hasn't voted might vote. Not to sway your decision about ma mailing the postage, the return postage, but just um, there's not a, for local elections. There is n there's only 20 days by the time the ballots get to me and um, town meeting is. There's not really a lot of time to mail them back. Um, I really um, strongly recommend that people return them here to the 24-hour security official box out front or bring them to the polling place on that day. It's, it's safer, we'll get them back versus mailing them. There's just not a lot of time. There is a process of going out and getting people, if they can't get out of their house for some reason, yeah, there's two people go get their ballots, right? If, if they're ill or disabled. Right. Yeah. So. I, I hadn't given my thoughts yet, but I'm disappointed because you know, for years and years and years, like my dad, my dad told me, oh, it's your civic duty to come in and vote. You come in and get your ballot, you come in to the polling place and you vote. And we've all become lazy. You know, we wanted these ballots to come to us now, you know, oh, because they can't get there. Well, when it's, <coughs> the truth is you can, you can request a ballot, we'll send you one. It's always been the way it is. So there's a big part of me that goes, we're sending everybody the ballot. We, we want to send them posted paid when you're supposed to, do your duty and get in here and vote. The gentleman back there says, oh, well, we want to know about it. We want to have our say. Everybody in this room can have their say just by coming here or request a ballot and you mail it in or whatever. It just, I'm so disappointed by people. It reminds me of my kids, you know, these millennial kids that expect everything to be done for them, you know. And I don't mean to be harsh because I know there's certain circumstances, but what, what Tom says is true. If it's 35% Return it. If I get that ballot in the mail, then I'll don't have to do anything except check boxes. I'll do it. You know, instead of the whole idea of it, this is your duty. You know, to, to participate in a vote for whatever it is. It doesn't matter. And it's just sad to me that it's like that. You know, and I guess it doesn't matter what I decide on because you guys have a, a majority. But I just I'm disgusted by it. You know, and that's how I really feel. It's like it's sad. That's why I've always fought it. Can I respond? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Tom. <laughs> I'm 67, 70, 76 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> a little froggy and slip for you. But, uh, and, 
and just to live that long, I, I think I'm, uh, I'm entitled to have you send me a bell. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a veteran. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I think I did enough <coughs> that deserve that you mail me a ballot. I've lived in this town for, I've lived in Lamar County for what, 40 years. Just doing that, paying taxes. No, I can't tell you how many the taxes. I think I deserve you to send me a ballot. I can go on thinking that, yes, I've done my part. You deserve, I deserve for you to send me a ballot. 20 percent of the Barsville residents are over 65 years old. They deserve you to send them a ballot. It's that simple. And I'll, the rest I'll come in here. I'm over 65. I'll come in and vote here in person. Well, that's good for you. Yeah. That's not everybody is able to and do it's that. It's and people are home with, with kids. They, they can't afford the child care to, to come into this. They got they live, they work out of town. They can't get off. The, the, your, the people that work in this office don't have off on ballot on annual day, day. So are you He's, requesting the ballot? No, I want it sent to me, like I said. That's, That's not really that. funny there. You're asking Brian, me. It's not funny, it is. I'm request I, I'm, I deserve you to mail me a ballot. We deserve what do I ask everybody for that asks for a ballot deserves a ballot, so okay. And, and that's what I'm saying. I agree with Bob, except I'm ready to go for mailing everybody their ballot. That's, that's good. I, I don't, don't think you hear a word I said, Brian. Oh, I did. No, I, well, I didn't hear. And I really but respect that's you. Fine. I hope you do send me a ballot. Yes. Thank you. It will cost a lot of $9,000. Sure. I hope you do. Yeah. <laughs> I've had my hand up for an hour. Can you not see it? Well, I can't see it now. I, I could not it's see it later. No. I can't see it. Me either. Okay, can I speak for a moment? Yes, go ahead. If, if um, please. Just sitting here listening to you guys, I think everybody on the board is overthinking this Australian ballot to be put on to vote. We're asking you to do this. I, I don't want Judy's opinion that she doesn't want to get rid of it. She can vote on that when it comes to it. But to change it, the day and the time, that's really not what the ballot, the, the petition is or what we're asking. We're just asking that, okay, what we're asking is if we don't get enough votes, we would like for you to put on the ballot that we would like to vote on Australian ballot if we can do that for next year. So I don't, everybody has their own opinion. The board has their opinion, but Judy's like saying, no, we're not gonna do that. I don't want that. That's when you go and vote, Judy. We should have a right to vote. Everybody should have a right to vote the way they feel. But if you don't put that out there for everybody to be able to vote, then that that's not transparency at all. Um, as, as far as the money, we're spending over $8 million on a budget. Oh, I think that we can afford nine to $11,000 if this H2 comes through, that everybody should be able to vote. You guys are passing an $8 million budget and you're fighting over like 1% of that budget, uh, less than that, to, to make everybody be able to vote. Now, the people that have signed the petition for me are child care workers, and they don't get the day off to go to daycare or to go to a town meeting. Uh, the, me, I work in the nursing home. We're so short staffed. Nobody in that nursing home that lives in Morrisville is going to go to town meeting for six hours this year. It's not going to happen. Uh, so I just feel that everybody, a few of you on the board are saying no, 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 no. And Bob is saying you're discouraged in everybody, but it's not, it, times have changed. Times have changed, they're gonna keep on changing. And people just cannot get there. So, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Bob, can I make a suggestion? That perhaps a board member would bring a motion to the table? That's what I was waiting and for. And then you have a discussion period to follow that, but yeah. you've heard a lot of discussion, perhaps that might be a better way to move forward on this yes. hour and a half into the meeting. Bob, I'm ready to make a motion. Go ahead, Don. I'd like to make the motion that we spend $9,000 and mail every 
Morristown resident on the voters list a ballot. I second. I have a motion by Don and a second by Jess. Is Do there we, any further discussion? I'm just wondering if the, the cost has to be in there. It, I didn't feel, it, I don't know if the cost needs to be in there because if it changes, then it no, messes it up. Yeah. 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 I, I would recommend. Go ahead, Sarah. I would recommend you remove the dollar amount and just say mail everybody their ballot. And I just um, want to clarify, regardless of H42? No, I actually didn't get a chance to finish that. So okay. can, I, can I rescind that uh, motion and make a new one? I right, just amend it. OK, so I would, uh, I would remove the $9,000 and add the uh, condition that uh, H42 passes and we are voting uh, on the budget on that ballot and other town matters. All right, I have an amended motion by Don, and do I have an amended second by Jeff? I second, amended second, yes. Yeah. Is there any further discussion? Go ahead, David. We can't hear you, David. Can you unmute him? Yeah, you did. Yeah. No. No. Good. Is that good? Yeah. That's better. Uh, can I have it put in the minutes that it, that this is to not include return receipts on these uh, ballots? No return receipt for that. It mails out, but not back in. We do not pay for both ways. He didn't say that. His motion did not. <laughs> You're right. correct. The motion said just we're just mailing. We're not sending okay. postage paid on the list. Go ahead. Get the hand up. Don't you? Is that language required one way or the other on this vote? That's the well. I mean, we don't say we're including postage, and we're not. What, or does it? Or does it? Who does it leave the decision up to whether uh, whether to include uh, return postage? It's in the it's in the uh, it's in the motion. Yeah. It only includes return postage if we say it does, and we didn't say it did, so it does not include return postage. Correct. So it's not okay. Well, uh, we'll see what happens. But my guess is there's that will be your biggest wastage of printing material. That's the option with the biggest waste of printing material uh, of the three choices. Um, if you do that, you might as well go the rest of the way and make sure uh, and go farther to making sure that they will all be returned. But you'll have the biggest none use uh, with that um, condition. The other question, I'm confused. Why, why is the use of mail-in ballots contingent on this article to be voted on by the legislature. I don't get that. Because if, because if the, um, because of H42 is not passed, then only the election of um, two select board seats would be on the ballot, and we don't feel that it's worth mailing everyone a ballot for two select board seats. Thanks, Jeff. We have another question in the middle up there, ma'am. Hi, it's Julie Nephew. I wanted to respond to Bob Beeman's discussion about the civic duty to, to vote and how does that impact Morrisville? You know, my mom has lived in Morrisville for 50 some odd, 70 years. I don't even remember when we moved there, but um, she can't come to the meetings anymore. She can't drive anymore. So the fact that people aren't coming to the meetings isn't necessarily a sign that they're not interested. She spends hours and hours talking about the political <coughs> involvement of Morrisville Select Board and, and the state and the national politics. So I want you to be cautious about, you know, saying that the fact that people can't come to the meetings is somehow a sign of their moral depravity. It's not, they are not necessarily, they are not necessarily trying to um, avoid their, their requirements. They love this democracy. They just can't get to the meetings. So how do we make this 
process more accessible? That's the whole question. And, you know, some of the older people, um, especially people over 65, and not necessarily Judy Bickford, but many people over 65, 40% of the people over 65 cannot figure out how to use smartphones or don't have smartphones and can't participate in Zoom. So, you know, they might be on this phone call tonight. They're just not not necessarily in their bailiwick. So just let's let's be cautious when we cast aspersions on everybody. Well, Julie, I just want to respond to your comments. First of all, I wasn't talking about whether or not you can come to town meeting. My mother's 83 years old. She doesn't come to town meeting, but she can request a ballot. And she does. I was not talking about anything to do with town meeting. I was talking about whether or not you send out ballots and how I'm disappointed because people are lazy now. You know, if my mom is in a nursing home, she requests a ballot, they send her one. So I'm, I'm not saying anything of what you're saying. So just so you know. So can I call the Lord? So I apologize if I misspoke. Bob, because, you know, if, if your mom's in a nursing home, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes we need access, and that means mailing ballots. Yeah. And how do you request it if you're in a nursing home? <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Laura Street's very quick. It's a federal law that if you drop a ballot into a mailbox, it has to be sent to the town. So if you don't have postage, drop it in. It's going to get here. Oh, I'll call the question, Mom. Wow. Okay. okay. All right. Is there any further discussion on this motion? So, all in favor to mail the ballots, not posted paid, but to mail everyone a ballot this year, say aye. 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 Don? He's muted. You're muted, Don. Thumbs up. I'm sorry. Aye. Those opposed? Nay. Nay. The ayes have it. The motion is passed three to two. Wow. All right. So we'll move to number three. Accept Stephen Foster's resignation from the Planning Council. I make a motion we accept it with a thank you. I have a motion by Brian and a second by Judy. Is there any further discussion on that? Bob, do you mind if I say a quick piece? Go ahead. I just wanted to thank the, the community and, and the board for their confidence in me. I've truly enjoyed spending my time on the planning council. Uh, I'm happy for the body of work we've created for the last several years. And I look forward to uh, continuing to serve the community uh, and LCPC uh, and as their Brownsfield liaison. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Any of uh, Don? Aye. Any opposed? Motion is passed unanimously. The board will find a thank you card in your uh, folder for We're signatures done. tonight. We did already. Yes. Okay. Number four, accept Laura Street's resignation from the Development Review Board. Can I make a motion to accept it with a thank you? I have a motion by Brian. Do we have a second? Second. Second, second by Judy. Oh, sorry. Is there any further discussion on this? Go ahead, Laura. I just want to say thank you. I've been on both planning and DRB. As you know, I've been kind of adamant about you shouldn't serve on two boards. Uh, I also feel like uh, there should be a turnover. Part of the reason I'm leaving is because we have two incredible alternatives who have spent a year um, learning and watching. Uh, they are ready to step up. One is Christy Snip that's here. One is Donnie Blake. Uh, I highly encourage there uh, the to be a spot or an alternate. I encourage you to uh, participate. It's the best way to understand and learn what's going on is being involved. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All in favor on that motion? Aye. Aye. Don? Aye. Any opposed? The motion is passed unanimously. All right, we'll move to number five, discuss moratorium on housing. This, ag this agenda I have, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, brought to you. Uh, I had a residence over the last uh, three to six months who was requested three times as be placed on the agenda. 
so for a discussion for the board members. That's why it's here. Okay. Come on up, Nancy. This all came about just from one simple question that I asked maybe three months ago. If, if concerned citizens wanted to petition or uh, go through the process of a moratorium of some kind in some way, not all construction in the area, how would we do that? And nobody could answer the question, and I still don't know that we're going to get an answer. Todd, can you speak to that for us? So a moratorium... Uh, Come on up. It's all about process at this point. Yeah. How they're asking about process. You talking? <coughs> Not on this issue. Oh, okay. no. So a moratorium can't be on one specific type of housing. The request that came from Nancy originally was multifamily housing for two years. You can't single out one form of housing versus another. It's a violation of the fair, federal fair housing laws, and will be sued by the Department of Justice three ways to Sunday. So. You have to be careful what you, what you do with the moratorium. It'd be up to the select board when you have uh, uh, a town plan or zoning change in front of you. And the you have to make sure you are singling out, you're not singling a certain type of housing out which you can't discriminate. And you also have to ensure that the moratorium is generally related to some sort of capacity issue. For example, we can't handle more housing downtown because we need a traffic light at the intersection, not the red blinking light. That's the kind of thing and we have to figure out how to pay for it. So give us two years to do that. That's generally how it's done. So it has to be a specific reason, like our infrastructure can't handle more. Generally housing. tied to it, yes. Yeah. And you can't single out one form of housing versus another. You can talk about different parts of town, but that part of town generally should be tied to an infrastructure question. But what is the process? That's all I'm asking. What is the process? I understand that piece. Mm -hmm. What is the process? I don't know the answer to that. I think the process would have to be that there, there would have to be a a problem like the infrastructure is under under stress or so would it would it need, would there need to be a petition would there need to be a request from a community member would there need to be what would there need to be a petition is one way to bring it to the to the select board and if you bring it in a petition form then it will re kick in uh, the requirement that Sarah is talking about but there's with no a special process meeting. to follow like check this check that for, there is. for you, that that? Secretary of State's office, you can talk to a woman called Judy Prosser. She can uh, okay. give you a That's, lot of information on okay. that. Right. That's really where I was going, trying to find that out. So, so it would so right. trigger a special meeting. If, if a petition is filed, that triggers a, a special meeting. meeting. And but then, it's not always necessary. And then, does that re and then does that force a vote? Or I don't mean, I don't mean force in a negative way, but I can't think of a better word. If a petition is filed yeah. with enough signatures, then a special meeting would have to be held. Mm -hmm. And at that meeting, you'd be voting on whether or not, whatever, whatever the, the uh, motion is worded. Um, There's nothing specific. It's just the process. I'm, I want the information mm -hmm. about the that. And the petition would, there, there would be a motion, and then the, the petition signers would be signing um, regarding that motion to come before the town. Is that correct? It's like all the other petitions. You have to have yeah. voter, right. a percentage of the voter. Yeah. Uh, now that I know that a different place to go for information, I think I'll go there. So, yes. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thanks, Nancy. I do also have um, Carrie Laura's on here for the Memorial Housing Partnership. And uh, hi, Carrie. Thanks for staying with us. Uh, can you give us a little rundown on, on the housing situation in our community? Um, sure. Um, so uh, thanks for having me. I'm Carrie Lohr. I'm the Advancement and Communications Director at Lamoille Housing Partnership. Um, if you're not familiar with LHP, we're a 501c3 nonprofit affordable housing developer, and our mission is to collaborate with communities to create and preserve quality affordable housing opportunities for Lamoille County and Hardwick, which is our service area. Um, I am happy to share some um, data about the housing, about our current housing landscape. And I'll just, before I jump into that, just preface by saying that um, as I'm going through this data, the focus on the rentals as well as the low and moderate income populations that I'll mention in a few minutes um, 
is due to our scope of work um, and our community role within housing development and housing preservation. Um, and any time that I refer to region or area, um, I mean our service area, which is Little Mile County and Hardwick. Um, so kind of a, a high level summary of um, the challenges of, of our housing ecosystem right now um, are disparities between incomes and housing costs, low vacancy rates, a housing production backlog, um, high demand and need for rental homes with limited uh, affordable options, um, and continuously rising housing prices, um, both rental and for purchase. Um, so just kind of getting into more granular, granular detail on um, those points, um, right now, sorry, 2022, um, the area's two bedroom housing wage, um, which is the hourly wage that one must earn and not exceed 30% of their income on total housing costs um, was $20.40 per hour, which is $7.85 higher than Vermont um, yeah. um, wage. Um, and I'll just pause there and say that that um, that the housing wage criteria, that 30% that I mentioned, um, is a standardized metric of affordability by um, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, in our area, the professions that are affected by this um, are restaurant and retail education, health and medical, social services, construction and administrative professionals. Um, people within these sectors um, struggle to or just straight up cannot afford um, the current two bedroom housing wage. Um, three out of four area renters um, are considered housing cost burdened using 30% and higher than 50% of their income on um, housing costs. Between 2019 and 2020, the area median um, home sale prices increased by 23%. Um, and I'll just put a period on that, that during the same time period, uh, Vermont minimum wage increased by 1.7%. Um, Moving to vacancy and supply, um, area housing, sorry, area vacancy rates have held steadily at um, just below 2% since 2018 um, and comparably a healthy rental, a healthy vacancy rate, excuse me, is um, three to three to, to 5%. Um, just 19% of the area's total rental housing stock has project-based subsidies and is considered affordable. Uh, and then between 2018 and 2019, um, 180 long-term rentals were converted to short-term rental or investment properties, which reduced the number of long-term rentals in the landscape by 18%. Um, in terms of production rates, since 2000, the area's average annual pace of housing production has been 0.82%. Um, which is down from an annual average of 2.5% during the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, moving over to demand for um, demand for affordable housing specifically, I'm going to refer to um, data from our, our own portfolio and kind of what we're seeing um, in our work specifically. Um, so during a 12 month period that started April, 2021 until April, 2022, uh, LHP's entire rental portfolio averaged five vacancies and 496 waitlisted household applicants uh, per month. Um, to kind of dive into that a little bit deeper, in April 2021, the applicant waitlist was 348. Um, and then the same month the following year, it had risen to 512. Um, it, during that time, LHP's portfolio had grown by two completed units in a multi-phase development that's called Riverbend Apartments, which um, since, let's see, when did we, we cut our ribbon in July of this past summer. So we've opened um, like 11 more units in that project since then, which is, it's a total of 16 units. We have a couple more that are coming online soon. 
Um, in December of this, uh, this most recent December in 2022, ending the year, the local continuum of care reported that there were 136 households comprised of 166 adults and 64 children that were experiencing or at risk of experiencing homelessness. Um, 107 households were experiencing literal homelessness, sheltering in the general assistance program, um, which is the hotel program through the state, um, a tent on the street, in a vehicle, or in a temporary shelter. Um, I'll also mention that rates of overcrowded housing are 2.3% across the community. Um, and uh, overcrowding is most frequently experienced by people who are earning um, below 30% of area median income or considered low income. Um, so I know I just rattled off a lot of <laughs> the percentages and numbers. Um, so I'll just stop there. And um, if anybody has any questions, I'll do my best to answer. And if I can't answer them, um, I'm happy to follow up with you uh, at a later time. So in a nutshell, there's a huge need for housing in Morristown. Nailed it. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, I guess my question is, how much of the housing stock that has been built in the last two years is actually affordable housing under this scenario? I personally don't see it. I mean, affordable housing if you work in Chittenden County, maybe, but not affordable housing if you work in Lamoille County. Can you answer that question? So um, I mentioned before that 19% of um, this housing stock in the area is um, is development with project-based subsidies. The majority of that is Lamoille Housing Partnership developed. Um, in the last two years, well, in the last, let's see, in the last two years, we started Village Center Apartments, which is the development right in the center of Morrisville. It's going, it's going to be 24 apartments. We were hoping that we would be moving people in this past summer, but of course, um, the July 4th fire happened. Um, right at this moment, we have that project, plus we have another 25 units that we're partnering with Graham Mink on in our um, Gordon Lane project, sorry, excuse me, development. Um, trying to remember. I, 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 I'm not sure, I'm not sure what else was more recent in Morrisville. This is, this is your organization though. I guess my question was to a, the greater development in the area, not just Memorial County housing development, but the greater development that's going on in Morrisville. How much of that is actually affordable? That, that, I, I think that, you know, is partially why there's sort of a discussion about a moratorium in, in Morrisville. Uh, so I, I don't know if anybody has those figures, but it appears to me, looking at what's going on, the construction, the size of the units, I don't see them being built in the same manner that female housing development is building units or the subsidies are there other than the 25 units that Graham Mink uh, put into that housing stock. So the, if anybody has that information, that would be really useful to understand and know. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. I did I didn't have the <laughs> occasion today to, to uh, <coughs> meet with a developer, one of our local developers that is working on a 54 unit project and I toured his his properties today. They're very, very nice. And um, they're geared more toward a uh, two, two income family or you know one income with, with kids, uh, a really good income. Um, but they are affordable. I mean, I, I'm judging by the folks that I know that work in the industries around here like MSI and Concept2 and, and Butternut. And some of those folks are actually gonna be moving into some of those units. So in that, in my mind, that's affordable. If it's it, it's definitely higher than it used to be. You can't get an apartment anymore that's six hundred dollars a month or eight hundred dollars a month. But yeah. I'm seeing rents by these developers that, I mean, a studio starts at nine fifty a month, which 
That sounds like a lot to most of us in the room, but the going rate now is much higher. It's more between 1,500 and 2,000. 1,800, 2,000. Yeah, and um, I've got an apartment that's 1,800 a month, and people are knocking down the door to, to move into it. So. Well, that, that again begs the question. Uh, I think my greatest disappointment over all the development I see happening in Morrisville is not the development itself. It's the lack of us encouraging and fostering more MSIs, more Concept twos, more butternut and maple, more of the industries that we have in our community where we're creating jobs for people that live here, not jobs for people that drive to Chittenden County. If you go out to Route 100 at 7 o'clock in the morning till 8.30, it's bumper to bumper headed to Burlington or Chittenden County. We're, we're becoming a bedroom community. We're not, we're not developing jobs for people to live here. They sleep here. And that's my biggest disappointment with the development. It's not the development itself. It's that we're not coalescing it with jobs. And I don't want to see, I don't want to see Route 15 north and south, east and west, and Route 100 south to north, dotted with, with uh, Walmarts and Sam's Clubs and Costco's. I want to see Concept 2s. I want to see MSIs. I want to see Hearthstones. I want to see those kind of companies in Morrisville that create jobs for people to live here and be part of the community. That's, that is, that would be affordable housing as you're talking about. People working at Stone Mountain Resort, they're not making enough money to live in these places. They are actually making $20 an hour. To they stay. are. My, my high school students are making $20 an hour. Very good. Well, I mean. And again, yeah. that's part-time work though. Yeah, I, I'm not saying. And seasonal I'm, work. I'm not saying it's affordable or right. that. But it's also seasonal work. I'm talking about, you know, creating jobs that people have, you know, benefits year-round employment and become part of the community, part of the fabric of our community. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. I want to mention, just going back to the appropriations, the Lamoille Economic Development Council is one of those organizations that helps bring businesses to our community and support them. So it's part of our appropriation package. I know, and I do realize the past history that it was let go for a number of years through whatever reasons, I'm not sure. And, uh, you know, I wish that that had not happened. But it's, I, it's, it's, but it is in, in, reinvigorated, in, in yes. But, but that's what I really hope that we, the board, the town, the voters can look forward to more still looking like. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. And to also, to piggyback on um, something that um, I think Carrie mentioned and that Bob, you touched on, um, affordability, um, it's a, a unit might be affordable for a, a dual income <coughs> um, or someone with like one kid or no kids, but a lot of these units, um, and this is anecdotal evidence, but a lot of these units are not affordable for um, single parents. Um, or there's not enough space for a single parent and children. So um, it really does depend on a lot of factors. Um, um, so yeah, the affordability isn't necessarily there. I mean, I, I, and anecdotally, I, I know that when I moved back to Morrisville um, in 2004, I moved back here from um, attending college in New York City my rent, the rents I was looking at here were the same as they were in, in Brooklyn, in my neighborhood in Brooklyn, and I was, my earning potential was much, much less. Um, so, I mean, even back then, it was nearly impossible for someone who grew up here to come move back here and move here. In New York. Um, I don't know what, I don't know what the answer is. I, I think um, community involvement and, um, um, a vision process. It looks like that we have an art, um, an agenda item coming up next about um, forming a housing committee, and that that'll, um, that'll address a lot of the issues. Yeah. yeah. Dennis, you have another question up there? Yeah, I have a couple of uh, comments that lead to a process 
question. I believe Carrie rattled off the statistics and I believe it is a legal and technical definition. It isn't what does what does it seem like is affordable? It's what is the level of income and what is the rent? And if it's more than 30%, it's unaffordable. And that it's not what it seems like to Bob or whoever. It's, it's a federal law and it makes it, it's really clear what that is. Also, I believe, Carrie, when you said 19% of stock was developed with subsidies, that doesn't mean that 19% of the units are made affordable. It's within your, your thing on Hutchins Street, I believe some of them are affordable and the rest are market-based, if I'm not wrong. I can clarify, you, the 19% was total housing stock of the whole area. Right, but that doesn't mean that 19 are being brought onto the market at the affordable level. That means that of the stock, that project was subsidized. No, I'm saying 19% of the total stock the total housing stock of the entire Lamoille so County percent of the area, units. which is our service area. 19% of the units that are brought on, not 19% of the... No, of total housing stock of the area. Yeah, I'm trying to get at what, what the stock number means, but that's a technical issue, doesn't matter. What uh, I was saying, I believe, is that all of the housing units in that project are affordable. No, not No, they're yeah. not. Yeah. They're not. What I'm saying is, um, sorry, maybe I should use a different word. I'm yes, I'm talking about total number. You've got like four units that are affordable in that. Here, let me back up a little bit. I'm saying that 19% of the total housing inventory of the entire area has project um, subsidies. Yes. So that means that your project on Hutchins Street has subsidies, but only some of the units there are going to come out as affordable because the rest are not required to be affordable under by, by terms of the subsidy correct some of them are market rate but that's correct. pretty consistent with what we do no i'm not anyway. i'm not pointing a finger at you i'm saying that nobody can look at the the 19 percent and say oh we have 19 percent affordable no you have some percentage of 19 percent that is affordable mm -hmm. so it's more like four or five percent that ends up being affordable that is affordable to somebody who can't go over 30 percent of their income by that definition. I think you might it's be a much lower a number bit. than 19% that is being brought on as affordable. The projects come in, but the, the number of units in the project are not. I think we're having, we're having a discussion in here, and it really, really needs right. to, need to come back. Right. So anyway, I wanted to say it's less than that. I believe I'm still correct on that, but I don't know. It doesn't matter. The thing I wanted to get to is the process question is like, we just had an hour and more of discussion of whether to allow a vote on whether to have an Australian ballot at some point in the future, and there's a 5% petition. This thing is on, the, is on the select board's agenda because one person with access made enough noise. And what is the issue with having, why would you have a moratorium on housing? What is the goal of that? Is that to stop people who might need housing from living here? The people that Kerry listed as falling under the limit were basically everybody who works for somebody who owns something. Any owner can, can afford things, but if you work at the school or you work in a daycare or you work at the supermarket, if you serve anybody who has money around here, you can't afford to live here. That's not right. And you should at least allow people to afford to live in the town where you want them to do the work. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Carrie, I appreciate your time and all the data you provided tonight. And um, it would be great to, uh, I, I appreciate the uh, all the updates you send us an email, too. It's been great. It's, I appreciate you taking the time tonight. And, and Jim, too, Jim's email today. So. Well, thanks for uh, having me, and I appreciate this discussion. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. All right, is there anything more on this uh, moratorium on housing? Any more comments? I thought we already had talked about that. I'm still on the hands up. I thought, I thought this, I thought the number five was already discussed and moved on. Yeah, we're done now. <coughs> we, we have now 
gone to number six. Okay. There are other people with their hands up. So now we're going to discuss the planning council request to form a housing committee. Do you want to talk about that, Todd? I think the chair of the board is not here to talk about it. Yeah. Oh, it did. Yeah. There you are. You were hidden. Hello. Hello. Have you been here the whole time, Etienne? I have, yes. Good job. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, th this was a part of the town plan process. Um, this planning council during that process uh, decided that it may be best to more holistically address some of these questions of housing and, and how to make a plan. Uh, to change zoning, to make uh, the type of housing we want to see uh, easier to build and appropriately placed. Uh, if we had a committee of people that was put in place uh, by Act of the Select Board, uh, some reasonable cross-section of, of community members, um, uh, and a relatively structured kind of goal and timeline, um, we made it a one year, uh, a one year priority. Uh, again, the town plan is now in place as of the end of uh, 2022. And so we're making this request to the select board. It sounds good. It'd be great to get a committee together. Do you need a, um... do you need a motion for that? Uh, I, we might have to, I might have to defer to Todd on the exact mechanics of it. I know there was some question about staffing <coughs> issues uh, at the town level that had to be addressed as well first. I would suggest that you put some sort of structure as to how many members of the committee mm -hmm. there will be. That uh, I would suggest perhaps a timeline for reporting back to the board like you did for the parking committee. Um, such that it's just not a committee in perpetuity that the interest dwindles usually that energy is uh, best up front and works hard for about you know six seven months whatever but yeah how many members um, do we have for the parking committee that was five right five, five. five. yeah it is a good number so what about table and don't meeting? um i'd like to make a motion yeah, <coughs> yeah go ahead. okay i make a motion that um the select board supports uh, creating a housing committee um, consisting of five members um, that works for six months and reports back to the select board. And Second. Their, and their, their focus, if I could add for a and focus. Their focus. And their focus is on creating, focus is on creating housing. Is that creating, um, creating housing and um, in line with um, the town plan objectives. Okay, I have a motion by Jess. Second. A second by Judy. Any further discussion? Etienne, what do you think of that? Um, yeah, that, I think that generally meets the meter of the letter that we wrote. Um, I think there was one concern about uh, a, town's, a town uh, employee being available to staff it. Again, in the guise of keeping this um, rigidly structured so that we that it is something is produced within that six month timeline legitimate concern mm -hmm. yes uh -huh. these uh committees usually meet after hours um, i don't have a lot of folks jumping forward to raise their hand to volunteer to staff this so i'm going to wait I, I would suggest this that we wait for folks to and i the process for this would be for folks to call in to judy uh, my assistant and give their name and their intent to serve on the committee and we can take a look at the members and see if there's someone there that has prior experience that perhaps might be able to run the meetings or is willing to conduct the meetings and, and keep track we've got we've got a volunteer right there i'll uh since it's not a standing committee and it's got a short lifespan 
Uh, based, based on the membership you get, I'll, I'll staff it. It's not another like, really late night meeting. I do enough night meetings, obviously. But yeah, I'll, I'll work with a group, and groups we can make work on a time and work, I'll staff it. That's great time. And we they appreciate can, um, that. And we put in the minutes to contact Judy and who are the number, the, either by emailing you. Email admin at morristownvt.org. And we'll put this advertising in the paper as well. And from Porch Farm. From Porch Farm. All right, any further discussion on this motion? Um, I want to make sure that it's, um, it's not just about developing new housing, but um, it sounds like being really um, deliberate um, and intentional about um, understanding what the current um, the current makeup of the housing is and where the new housing would be placed. It sounds like that's what the um, the intent is from our letter from the um, the planning council. So I'd like to um, include that in my motion. <coughs> Did you second that too, Judy? Yeah, I think if we follow the uh, objectives that are in front of us, mm -hmm. yeah, then that's that's our um, that's called. I know there's a word there, but I can't think of it now. That's our marching orders here. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, favorite, yes, yeah. Bob. D uh, Steve Foster, do you mind if I just hang in for a moment here? Go ahead. Can I offer the recommendation that <coughs> the goal of the, the committee is to identify housing opportunities, not necessarily to create housing? I know there's subtlety in that, but when taking an objective, um, that could be misinterpreted if the goal of the committee is to create housing. Simply, it sounds like the, the goal would be to identify opportunities where housing or make recommendations on, on where housing could be created. Yeah, okay. I agree with that. All right, so all in favor say aye. 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 Don? Excuse me. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is passed. Next, Thank you. discuss billing of paramedic intercept. So for uh, ever <laughs> prior to this. For ignoring people on Zoom. So our uh, emergency medical service team responds. Uh, they're a 911 response group. Uh, we follow mutual aid uh, with our surrounding communities. And on... Uh, on a more frequent basis now, we are being called to uh, assist neighboring ambulance services with a paramedic assist. We have six paramedics on our uh, EMS squad. Uh, it's, uh, it's an incredible team to have if you understand the, the training behind becoming a paramedic, but it is something to be uh, admired. But we're being called frequently to go out of town uh, on a paramedic assist to an ambulance service that may only have basic life service, basic life support crews on board. When our ambulance arrives on scene, the paramedic gets off from our ambulance and into the other ambulance and now takes over and directs care for that patient. They ride to the hospital, patient's delivered to the hospital, our paramedic gets back into our rig and goes back to the shed. There is. Hold on a second, Eric. Yeah. There's a lot of talking going on in the hall. Can you please not do that. If you need to talk, you need to go outside because it's really disruptive. Thank you. The end result is the annual service that transported the patient gets to bill the insurance company at a higher rate of response and advanced life support response, and the payment from the insurance companies is much higher. Our crew, who has provided the paramedic and directed that care, cannot bill anybody. We get nothing, but we've responded to another community because of the, the quality of the, the uh, personnel we have. What I'm asking the board for permission to do, and this is not out of the, out of the norm, uh, NEMS, the annual squad that covers uh, Johnson, High Park, Waterville, Belvedere, and Eden, uh, has been billing the town of Morristown for years for paramedic intercepts when requested uh, to the total $250 per response. So 
we are in a position now where that request is happening to us quite frequently with no ability to build insurance to recover our, our expenses. So I'm asking the board to give me permission to begin billing ambulance services or municipalities, whichever runs their ambulances, uh, for a total of $250 per paramedic intercept. So your suggestion is to start billing? I, for the paramedic intercept. There's a, there's a larger story here about how often we're going to communities whose rescue squads are terribly understaffed, but I'm not going to bring that into this tonight. I simply want to address the paramedic intercept piece. Bill, you have any comments on that? Yeah, um, in calendar year 2021, we did 12 paramedic intercepts. Can you, sorry, Bill, can you oh, come up? Yes. We have like 20 people on the phone. Oh, okay, hold on. <laughs> ASI joint doesn't like getting up on the hill. Um, so in calendar year 2021, we did 12 paramedic intercepts. As we've increased paramedic staffing in calendar year 2022, just finished, we did 39. Um, and uh, Eric's correct, when our paramedic gets on board a, another services truck, it's our paramedic <clears throat> that increases the level of care on that truck at a reimbursement level. What we're asking is uh, now that that host agency, the agency that requested us, can now build that higher rate um, because of our paramedic and our equipment uh, that uh, we be recognized by them and reimbursed by them for that. Um, in this area of the state, the, the rate for that has been established by other agencies at $250 per occurrence, uh, and we're just falling in line with that. So it's certainly not unreasonable for us to start billing when that happens. Right. Uh, we're not billing the patient, we're billing the requesting agency and because they're going to in turn bill the insurance. Um, and the difference between that BLS billing rate and that ALS billing rate is what they're passing on to us in theory because we're the ones making them an ALS truck uh, in managing a critically ill or injured patient. Great. Thanks, Bill. So do you need a motion for this? Yes, please. I make a motion that we bill, authorize. authorize our administrator to bill um, outside communities that use our services for paramedics and Intercept. intercepts for $250 per um, incident. incident. Thank you. Right. I'll second it, but I'll put in an authorized team in. <laughs> Authorized saw that coming, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. All right, I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion on it? Yes, I have discussion on it. Go ahead, Julie. I, rec I think that it's not wor worth doing this at 250. I think you should do it at the going rate. Setting the, setting the amount at today's rates is going to make you vote every year in perpetuity. I think you should set it at the rate that is uh, appropriate for uh, other communities. I thought that's what that is. Okay. Right, we're doing she it. said 250 per, per se, 250. Yeah. 250 is not the same as what it is every year. Same, same. We, we have not done it previously. This, right. would be a, this is a new model for us. Right. Right. Um, and the $250 rate is based on precedent with the other Lamoille County right. service right. that does provide it. Right. The same as yeah. yeah, we understand that. Yeah. Okay. 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 Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Don? Aye. Any opposed? Motion is passed. Unanimously. Next, discuss Elmore EMS subscription. <clears throat> Sorry, I jumped ahead. So uh, I sent a letter, or actually sent an email to the town clerk in Elmore back in early November, <coughs> which outlined the fact that expenses had continued to climb for our EMS team. And 
I had noticed during building the budget that the appropriation that Elmore pays to the town of Morristown for ambulance coverage has not increased since 2018. So what I looked at trying to do and trying to be fair in my assessment to them, the needs of Morristown and the growth of Morristown and the increase in staffing we've seen at our ambulance building not necessarily reflects the needs or the growth within the town of Elmore. However, what they pay us in the subscription rate covers the cost of readiness, not the cost of response. The cost of response we bill insurance companies for. We'll probably never recover the full amount that would cover that, but it does help. The cost of readiness is heating the ambulance building, uh, putting tires on the ambulances, the staff pay, uh, and many other things. Their rate that they've been paying since 2018 is $26,000. The proposed budget for the ambulance squad this year is $882,000. So at $26,000 and having not had a an increase in four years, what I asked Tina to do was to give me the cost of living adjustments we had applied to staff wages over that same period of time. And I applied those percentage increases to their allotment and it took out to $35,000, which is a $9,000 increase. It's a 30% increase to their uh, subscription rate. They invited me uh, a couple weeks ago. I got an email from the chair of the Elmore board to meet them at, their, at a meeting to explain the 30% increase. And I did. I provided them with information about the uh, number of calls. Bill provided me with a lot of research, number of calls to Elmore, number of civic events that they supported uh, in Elmore, uh, and how they staffed those. I also provided them with a uh, copy of last year's 2021 town report from the town of Worcester. And I told them, I said, I don't like to compare apples and oranges. I don't know population between Worcester and Elmore, how it compares. I don't know miles of road. I don't know any of those figures. But what I did see was that last year, the town of Worcester paid the Montpelier Fire Department $41,000 as a subscription rate for coverage in their community. So having seen that and knowing that I had asked for 35,000, I thought we were being fair. Uh, they got back to me today through the, they had a meeting today about their budget and uh, the town clerk called me and said that what they would like to do is offer to pay half of that increase this year and then half next year, which would take them to the $35,000 mark as of the following of the 24 budget, if that's agreeable with you folks. Mm -hmm. Sounds fair. Do you need a motion? I do. It would be a, a motion to accept the $30,500 this year from the town of Elmore as a subscription rate for AMO services and the following year for $35,000. Okay. I've already forgotten it. <laughs> Can I just say so moved? Sure. Sure. We can spell it out. I think we understand the intent. <laughs> and I'll say I'll second. <laughs> we have a motion and a second on the floor. Is there any further discussion on this change in price? Tony, come on up. I guess I just don't understand. We can't afford our own budget at $10 million and we're going to other communities. I realize nobody wants, I mean, everybody needs survival or whatever you want to call it. How many of those calls do you do, you do that are actually life or death? Well, we could go back and go, I could go through the data and look at how many of those calls are BLS versus ALS. And ALS has a one rate and an ALS two rate, which is cardiac arrest type stuff. Yeah, no, I understand that. And everybody, yeah. everybody wants to live. Right. I understand that. Yeah. But we Morristown people can't afford our own budget, and here we are catering to other people. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Enough is enough. The town of Elmore has been paying a subscription rate to the town of Morristown for over 20 years. I don't know when it started. Nobody had recollection back that far. But that, yeah. that, came, it up. that came from a uh, firefighter from Elmore. It's been on for a long time. So. Thanks, Eric. All right. 
All in favor say aye. 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 Don? Aye. Any opposed? This motion is passed. Next, review the highway mileage certificate. Annually, the certificate comes in from the Agency <coughs> of Transportation. It is a, uh, an opportunity for us to add mileage that we cover, our highway department covers, so that we can receive uh, reimbursement from the state for highway maintenance. Uh, most years, we simply sign this form. I bring it to the board, they vote on it, they sign it, we send it back in. But this year, we had some changes. Uh, we were given provisional status on two roads in town that were uh, the board voted to take over. One is uh, Belanger Road, Road and the other is Pope Meadows. And we were just lacking some documents last year to fulfill the, the requirements for the state to add this to the state GIS map uh, permanently. Right now it's on provisionally. So we have the documents and you'll see there's a reference under number three in the middle in part two, reclassified or remeasured. And we attached, put an attachment on there. And the first one speaks, <coughs> let me go to the second two. So this, the second one is Belanger Lane, Town Highway 122. is changed from provisional to permanent. We're sending down all of the easements granted to us by the homeowners along that road. Uh, and the minutes from the meeting where the town adopted the road as a town highway. Mm -hmm. So that will make that a permanent road. Pope Meadows, we received the easement from the uh, the folks there and the same thing we're sending all documents in so that'll be a full-time road uh, they've been giving us paying us for these roads but this the provisional status only lasts a certain amount of time so this takes care of that the first part there is a uh, they tried to tell me that we had changed the intersection at the intersection of Walton Road and Cody Hill from a T to a Y and two phone calls and a map from Google show them that this has been a Y intersection forever. Uh, the town did not change anything. So as it turned out, it was a mapping thing that they've changed at their level. This, uh, this is just an, ex an explanation that will be never a normal crossroad between Cody Hill and Wall Road, the little, the short stubby crossroad in the corner there. Yeah. State never used to put that on maps. Now they are. So the software saw this and said, oh, they've changed their intersection. So now it's, it's a remapping piece. So longer explanation than needed to be for their own issue. So. Okay. So do you need a motion? To a motion to accept it. So moved. And a motion by Brian. Second. And second by Judy. Is there any further discussion on this motion? Okay. Well, I have a question. Go ahead, Bob. Um, Eric, uh, if someone petitions the town to take over a road, is it the requirement that there are three individual households that live on that road? There have to be five structures. Five structures. The road has to be a minimum of 1,000 feet in length. It has to have been constructed according to uh, our policy, our road policy, okay. uh, which That's is very expensive. Uh, yeah, there's also contingencies in there about the stormwater system, so. Right. Yeah. That's what I thought. Thank you. Thank you. So if you're interested, we currently have 106.969 miles of road we maintain. In addition to that, we have 1.11 miles of legal trail, 9.39 miles of class 4, and then 0.4 miles of a class 1 lane, which I couldn't tell you what that is. But somewhere around 100, 107 miles is what our highway department maintains. <coughs> All right, any further discussion on this motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Don? Aye. Any opposed? Motion is passed unanimously. And I will need signatures from all board members on the bottom of that certificate, please. All right, next is discuss the class four road policy. So in the last six months, I've had three requests uh, coming in to have private entities do upgrades to class four town highways. Most recently, I have one up in Sterling Valley, uh, on the Ross Hill end near Ron Terrell Road, and another one off of Mud City Loop on the, the Bull Moose Road. Our current policy, highway policy, speaks to what the town won't do on class four maintenance. It doesn't speak anything to what we require of private entities if they want to improve the quality of a class four road. So 
I reached out to Jim Barlow, our municipal law attorney. I asked him if he would have a sample policy that would provide us a starting point for discussion on this, and he did. And this is what is included in your packet. The only edit I've made to it is to take out the Agency of Transportation Road Standards and insert our uh, road policy standards. Other than that, it's untouched. I don't believe for a moment that you're going to pass this tonight as it is written because there are items in there that don't necessarily fit the character of our community. We currently already have folks who live on Class 4 roads and have been plowing those roads for decades, in fact. Uh, to get to and from their homes. But this, this sample policy, again, just a starting point for us, would say that annually that person would have to come in and get, a, for $50, get a permit to plow that class four road. So there are, this, this permit, again, this comes from an attorney. It is a tried and tested policy as it's written. But I firmly believe that the, the board will want to look at this to see if its language actually fits what we have here going on in Morristown. And I think there are scenarios in front of you right now or that are being requested. Uh, it shows a difference in the, the desire to increase those roads in size. One would be for access to a residence, and the other is access to an agricultural field. So they're two different, very different uses for the road. Would the upgrade to the road need to be the same in both instances? I don't know. Uh, that certainly can be discussed at a, at a different time. So I'm bringing this policy to you for awareness in that we have a, a gaping hole in our road policy where it comes to class four roads and allowing private entities to do upgrades to them. And I'd like to start with this policy as a, just as a beginning point and then uh, and, and work on this to see if we can bring some uh, Morristown character to it the end result is the select board on behalf of the town is responsible for the maintenance of class four roads if class four roads are upgraded by a private entity and they're done to a substandard you are left with a substandard road that people are going to access and now they're going to they can come back on the town in the liability format so there there's much at stake here on class four roads there are some communities that have thrown up all their class four roads there's others that have uh, banned all development on class four roads, uh, not allowing any improvements. There's, there are many different options out there, uh, but it remains to be seen where you folks want to go with this, but this is a starting point for you. you ha we have in front of us Town of Morristown Road Policy, mm -hmm. and the, the number seven is in red print and, and marked out. That's correct. So, does the whole Appendix 3 replace what's been crossed out? That's correct. Okay. And because Appendix 3 is four pages long, yes. <laughs> I didn't want to insert it under number 7. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I put it in there. It takes away number 7 on here is Class 4 road maintenance. It only speaks to what the town will not do to Class 4 roads. If there's nothing in our policy about this. So okay. we need a starting place. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. <coughs> uh, but basically, like in a nutshell, the new high, highway policy would say that if anyone wants to alter, repair, or improve the classroom highway or um, in the summer or do winter maintenance, that they have to get a permit from the town. It's an, I think we can, well, speaking of the winter maintenance piece, it's an awareness piece. That, mm -hmm. So we know who it is that's the, right. doing the winter plowing. I mean, that's. Yeah. I don't know that we need to attach a dollar amount to it, honestly. Mm -hmm. It's just a, an awareness piece um, mm -hmm. that we may bring into the fold. Mm -hmm. uh, on the summer road maintenance, there are even, not even the permit cost, but there are other things mm -hmm. suggested in here, and Jim suggested we not take those out, and that's the surety bond. Right. Uh, if someone's going to do work on a road, they... Level. You know, yeah, so if they say they're going to do this work, and then you authorize them to do it, and they go in and they do a a terrible job and leave a mess, the surety bond will be there in order for the town to have the work completed and then be paid out of that surety bond. So there are some protections built in there if you're going to allow somebody to do it that they follow through with what their plans are. Does anybody have access, anybody's allowed to use a class four road in Morristown? Morristown. Class four roads are public highways. They can't be restricted only uh, in a farm field. They can put up what's called a pent gate. And that's a gate that can keep their animals in an enclosure, 
but is able to be taken down and people can pass through and then put the fence back up uh, after they've gone through the fence. Okay. Um, how much is it, what's the cost for um, someone to obtain a surety bond? Is that like, is that attainable or is that going to make it so that like regular folks? It's an insurance policy. Okay. Uh, they're not horribly expensive, but I couldn't give you a dollar figure off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. It's like getting a liability insurance policy to hold an event at the Oxbow. It may be a little more expensive than that, but okay. it's the same concept. Typically, surety bonds are there just as the insurance policy. Whoever's going to do this work is going to do it and complete it. Typically, they want to make the, the road better mm -hmm. for whatever their purpose is. So. Kevin, how much are you doing on Class 4 roads right now? What, is, what really happens right now? Most of my Class 4 roads. We don't deal with it at all. I mean, right. if somebody calls in, we have to, they want to put in some culverts, and we give them the culverts to put in. Or if they have water barriers, you'll keep the water barriers so they'll have good runoff, that kind of stuff? No. No? No. We don't maintain. You don't maintain there's water trees barriers. Down, you, don't, part of our you, you don't take trees, yeah. So, no. no. Okay. Bob, you have a question. Hold on. Bob, then you can go. Yeah. Uh, I spend a lot of time on class four roads. I'm an avid cyclist. I ride on dirt. And I run into issues on class four roads. People thinking that because they have a house on a class four road, the road is private. I've had this issue on Gallup Road through Town Highway 49. Um, Churchill Road, not. Ross Hill Road, yes. Bull Moose Run, yes. Um, Ron Terrell, yes, and I have a question for Eric. Is Worcester Ridge Road, was that originally a town road, Worcester Ridge Road off Elmore Mountain Road? It was a stagecoach road at one point, I mean, way, way back. Uh, yeah. I would have to look at it, Bob. I know I've seen the sign. But I can't picture where Worcester Ridge Road it's is. It's, a, it's, it's like, off Elmore Mountain. Well, I understand. Road. I just don't it know where. Those are the top of the mountain. Beyond Elmore Knowles. I think that's Elmore. Is, Elmore. is that Elmore? Okay. It's Elmore Stone. Okay. okay. Um, right anyway, so if somebody does these developments or whatever they're doing on these town roads, what does that mean for usage? But, but I've been actually assaulted. <laughs> had been on private property and at one point I actually went to the police station in Morrisville and said hey this is a town road what's the deal and so uh, I guess I I'm quite concerned about somewhat protecting I, I view it as a really nice resource it, it's just a place to get away to be quiet to you know to somewhat protect some of our natural environment. Uh, these are just beautiful little gems that we have. And um, I, I would just like the, the board and, and the town highway department to consider uh, that request, that we try and maintain them as little as possible. And for the people who are developing them and live on them, they don't own them. And it, it should be made clear to them that they can't accost people for using those, those class four roads. But it has happened, and not only to myself, to other people as well. So thank you. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Selena, you want to go next? Yeah. And then Lee, you go. All right, I'll try to make this brief because I know it's really late. But I just want to kind of give you my personal perspective of our class four road usage and then um, give you some of what I think would be good changes to make on the new proposed policy. So basically this came about because um, there's a piece of land that we've been using for, I don't know, 60 or 70 years that got sold and we've been able to cross their property until we had issues with the new neighbors. Um, and so we're being forced to use Bull Moose Road as our farm road to get out to the end of our pasture instead of going across their field. Um, so I asked Eric on the fourth of the month, um, what do we need to do? Because we need to make the road wider to get farm equipment out of there, through there. And 
he showed me the old policy. Great. I, you know, followed it and asked you guys for permission. And then I was told that the policy was going to be changed, which was really frustrating because this is a very timely matter. Um, and so he showed me what the new policy was. And after looking at it, it was just, I've lost a lot of sleep about this because it's just cost prohibitive. There's no way we can afford to make our farm road based on these guidelines. It's just going to cost too much money. The insurance, a million dollars, you know, up to two million. Two million is like 10 times as expensive as the one million dollar policy. But I just wanted to ask, has there been any liability issues? Has anybody sued you because of class four roads? No, but no one has asked to improve class four roads since I've been here. So. That's because we've been improving them for 65 years without any problems whatsoever. I mean, we've widened this road so many times. We've done all the maintenance on it. Um, we never asked the town for anything. Um, Kevin, you can probably speak to, you get along with my dad really well. I mean, there's a good rapport with the highway crew and with our farm. There's just never been a problem. So to have this roadblock thrown up is just really discouraging. Um, about 10 years ago, you might remember this, Bob, and if Bonnie's still here, she probably remembers. We had a, a class four road, a different one, the Hadlock Road that we wanted moved because we wanted it along the edge of the field. And it was so much less effort to move a 2,000 foot road than just to open up this little road that we have now. So I'm really frustrated by how much time and energy it's taken to really try to get permission to do this. Um, I've made some notes just so I wouldn't forget anything, but basically the new policy is really burdensome. It's costly. I compared it to Stowe and a few of the other county towns, and it's so much more restrictive than their policies. Even the VLCT's um, policy is not as restrictive as this. The 30-day waiting period is just too much. Um, I, my feeling is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. What we were doing before was working. I just don't see how filling out a permit is really any better than coming to the select board, everybody giving their side, working it out, and, and you guys coming to a, a decision. Um, I feel like this policy discriminates against lower income people. I think that the more wealthy people moving in to these class four roads are the only ones that are gonna be able to do any updates based on this policy here, because it is, you know, it's going to be $100,000 to bring a road up to what it needs to be to follow these guidelines. Um, and when you have something that's so expensive, it's really encouraging large developments because if we can't widen our roads up to use farm equipment, then the only people that can afford to open it up are people that are going to buy it and develop it, which we don't want to do. We want to conserve it. We want you know people like Bob to be able to bike through Bull Moose. Um, is that the way to up there? Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. I would agree with you 100. percent I use that road a lot, and it's a beautiful yeah. place. Yeah. Your farm equipment has never been an issue. <laughs> but the new neighbors definitely block the road constantly. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, it feels like if we can't open up this road that the town is in effect making it landlocked because if we can't get out there to do the work, then it really isn't, it, there's no access to it, which is frustrating. I feel like the burden is being passed on to the landowners and I'm, you know, we're fine with paying the cost to upgrade it, but not to the standards that are in this policy. You know, looking at the policy, a lot of the class three roads in Morristown do not even meet some of these standards, like the stormwater standards. So I don't feel like a class four road that we're just using for people biking and for our farm equipment should be brought up to such a strict standard. Um, so what I would do to this policy, um, I would add, Stowe had, um, I think it was the Department of um, Parks that had made a request that when they asked to be able to improve a road that they also had like permission 
down the road and in the future to keep maintaining it. It's so like if a tree falls down, do you have to get permission to cut it? No, you can just keep maintaining it as you go. So I think adding something to the policy that says that you can maintain is necessary to keep it up instead of constantly getting a permit or permission would be handy. Um, I would like to see an ag exemption. Um, there's a lot of, and I, I think it should be for real farmers. There's COVID's brought a lot of what I call faux farmers, fake farmers, and the town has, the state has this rule that you know if you make two thousand dollars, you're considered a farmer. However, um, I think it should be what the current use guidelines are, in that you have to have fifty percent or more of your income coming from ag to be considered a farm and get a farm exemption. I'd like to change the 30-day waiting period to two weeks. I'd like to completely get rid of the winter maintenance. Um, we plow the roads just when we're logging, so we don't really, um, it's not like we live out there and we're plowing the roads. It's um, you know just as needed for logging, but there's so many of our neighbors that live on a class four road I don't think they should have to pay $50 a year to have their driveway, a permit to plow their driveway. I think it's just a burden. I don't think they should have to meet the insurance needs or bonds and damage deposits. I think that it's really hard for a lot of people on class four roads. It seems like we're either really low income or like incredibly high income. And the people that are low income are this is just burdensome to have to pay a lot of extra money. And it's going to be burdensome from you to get like a ton of permits every single year to plow roads. I think there's an easier way to do it. And I don't think, as far as I know, there's ever been a problem with people plowing class four roads, except for, you know, once in a while they might drag the snow into the road instead of, instead of pushing it over the bank. But that's something that Kevin and his, uh, predecessors have always dealt with. Um, so I'd like to get rid of anything to do with winter maintenance. What I really think you do need to do is keep the liability policy. It's kind of shocking that your old policy doesn't have anything about liability because when you're maintaining a road, it's, you know, there's trees being cut. So I think the liability policy is huge, but it, I don't think that there's any need for the extra insurance as long as that liability waiver is signed. Um, I think it's great to keep the snow machine trails in there. I think that's a part, good part of the policy. And I agree with the notifying um, the select board two days after the work is done. I think those are all good things. So that is all of the information I have and just wondered if any of you had any questions for me. Yeah. You know, it sounds like you make a lot of sense. This, this is a legal opinion of, of uh, when we got from our attorney and what he wanted to see us have for the policy. But it's obviously not what we've done in the past. Yep. So, so this is just a thing for us to start with. Right. 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 And, and in there, I thought I read it's only $50 when you get a permit, not for every year, right? Every year. You have to get a permit. You have to get a permit every well, year. Well, we can design that, right? Okay. Yeah. I so I would like to see us get a copy of those. Because you I would read there because we can't get to work work there, so try to make it work. But we there's some other work. people here with class four roads. I wondered if any of them wanted to speak to the this. The thing I well. want to make sure we yeah, do sure does. <laughs> I want to make sure that we're covering the town. Okay. You know, make sure that whoever's there is not doing something that's going to come back on the town. Yes, and that's where a liability waiver is key. Yeah. My daughter's in law school taking a property class right now, and it's very uh, pertinent to the issues we're having with our new neighbors, but a uh, liability clause is key, and it's kind of shocking that you haven't had one in there to date. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a question? Come on up. I don't have a question, but I just want to introduce yourself, please. Yes. Uh, Joe Streeter, Morrisville. I live on Ron Taylor Road, have it for 40 years. Um, we've never had a problem. I don't know why you want to touch anything up there, really, but um, we have some neighbors, Todd Pinkham, Will Spencer, we maintain it. 
Kevin, we get some sand from him. It's froze now. <laughs> um, I just think it's, I've spent thousands of dollars in breakdowns and I've never asked for anything. <laughs> Leave us alone. <laughs> we chose to live on a class four road. The aesthetics. Um, we don't want it brought up. I mean, that's the consensus of my neighbors. We want to leave it the way it is. And to have to pay to plow my or your roads is absurd. It's just, it's wrong. That's all I got. Thank you. How can you argue with them? I mean, come on. For what those folks have done for this town, I and mean, what they not do now, all their land is open to anybody in the town. I mean, I, I, they should be writing the policy, not the lawyers. Sorry, I, I just. One more. One more. Come to the microphone, please. Yes, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm calling on Zoom, and I'm actually calling his neighbor, so I would appreciate being able to be heard as well. Okay, I didn't see your hand up, but go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, no problem. Maybe there's some type of an agricultural clause that could be. Uh, used here to help you know people that are using it uh, uh and, and i know Selena, i'm up there quite a lot uh yeah I, I think that that would be wrong to to have them go jump through those kind of hoops to to be able to to use that and then again as he said that it's, it's these class four roads are open for everybody they they're they're just a real gem to have and I would hate to see that go away. Okay, thank you. Ma'am, go ahead. Hi, uh, my, I'm, my name is Alexia Maisel and my husband, Alex. We live at uh, Bull Moose Road and our, uh, oops, can you hear me? Because it sounds like it blanked out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yep, so um, I understand um, about the exorbitant cost and also we have spoken to Kevin because um, we experience a lot of erosion in our driveway um, due to, you know, it's a class four road, but we love it. And, um, I'm fine with leaving it 100% alone. And also I am open to, um, Selena being a, you know, and the root all whoever <laughs> being able to work on that road to be able to access their upper, upper fields. Um, I would just like to have the appropriate, you know, surety from the, the town and who and Selena or whoever may uh, develop that um, to fit her machines or whatever that you know the work has to be professionally accomplished and does not affect my my you know one side of it is like a foundation wall of my house and the other side is where my garages are because I own both sides of 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 the road there um, we are a small farm and are working to develop our farm. At completely as our livelihood my husband grew up on a farm his whole life as well um we are new to the area but we are not new to the country or farming and um i totally appreciate her need to get up there and um as long as it could be created in a way that does not damage us you know like uh like i have some like I don't know. Yeah, like as long as, as the machines could be got up there and there is a guarantee, you know, I, I understand the town is responsible for what happens there. Um, and uh, I'm the state, I guess, because it's a class four road. But as long as it is accomplished in a way that does not damage my garages, my, my home, I have no problem with widening the road so that a uh, bailing machine and whatever um, else needs to get up there can can get up there. Um, you know, we have other needs across where they traditionally had access. And, you know, if, if they need to go up that road once again, or if they choose to access through Dave's brother's property or whatever, that, you know, that's all on them. But it, going past my house, uh, you know, mine and Alex's home, not just our field, um, the only uh, assurance that I'm worried about is, you know, if a tree smashes my garage or my house, 
who's got my back there or you know if there's not tree trunks left look in the, a mess and the drainage and all of that what water etc is managed properly because it would not not fair to me that it you know i'm already experiencing you know driveway washout and messiness and so you know as, as long as all of that is ameliorated i have no issue with with widening that road i have i love that bikers go up past there and hikers and it's this is one of the best spots in all of all of vermont as far as i'm concerned and and to maintain the character of it is extremely important to me so i mean as far as like i mean the rules the way they're straight written is fine i couldn't you know we've spoken to kevin before and I couldn't afford really to do the road work to widen the road and put in the drainage at, during, you know, we can't afford to do that <laughs> either. Not this year anyways, hopefully when we, you know, begin to generate some income. But um, at this moment, like, no, we, we didn't even ask you guys because we can't afford it. But, um, it, you know, if I'm fine with reaching some sort of accord where as long as, hey, I'm protected and if something comes down on any of my stuff and that it doesn't look muddy or ungraveled or make a mess to me i have no issue with you know we 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 all have you know alex and i have no issue with and you know any sort of uh amplification or whatever needs to be uh, to get up that road i mean i'm happy to um come to an agreement between um well it would be too much selena who, who, who needs to do that and we, we can uh you know we can with the town uh, you know needs to decide what uh, is protecting them well enough too because obviously you know i need to protect myself and my property and the town needs to be assured that you know you guys are also coming out in good shape and who's i, I agree with selena like i i don't think you know you need a, a a yearly permit to to plow it or whatever i mean selena doesn't go up there N none of us I don't know. I don't use it in the winter. Thank you. Thank you. He slid right on it. Well, I think we're not going to settle this tonight yeah. by any form. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, um, I also would weigh in to say, like, um, second, I think what Brian was saying and, is, um, and what Selena is suggesting is that we do um, have some kind of um, ag um, exemption and maybe we do look at the land use um, standards around what that means um, and I that was my like first intuition was like how um, not making this onerous to people who are already doing all the work so um, and of course maintaining the, um, the, the beautiful rural um, resource that we do have um, I also like to bike those roads um, so um, yeah, I, again, I, I just want to put my two cents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we have to have another discussion. Uh, can I jump in just really quickly? Go ahead, Don. Um, I agree. I agree with Brian. I agree with Jess. And um, I want to thank Joe and Selena and the others for giving us the comments that they have. I also want to thank Eric for bringing this forward. And I know there's a lot of language in here. Um, I have a feeling it's going, going, to, going to change. And um, I think this policy gives us a starting point, a place to move forward. And uh, that uh, I, I hope we can, uh, I hope we can find some common ground here. Agreed. Do any other comments on the town room? Do you want to say something, Lee? Well, I was going to say that that road. Uh, has washed out. Come, on up. Come up here to the microphone. They can't hear you out on the computer. That bull moose road has washed out for a hundred years. I've been up there 60 years, and uh, and the bottom of it is always washed out with gravel and crap in the spring. So to make a farmer fix it, um, it's a little ridiculous, and I can understand the Roonies um, wanting to widen the road a little so they can get their equipment to their fields. Um, I don't think anything should be changed except 
give them the right to do it. Uh, you know, if they're willing to uh, sign a surety bond, fine. But to make any of these people like Joe or the Bidwells, they have to get to their sugar house through an old town road. Why um, make it difficult? We've got few farms as it is left in this county. And if it wasn't for the land and the tourists just driving up around Mud City to see it, you, there's, I mean, there's two farms left in Mud City. When I first moved up there, there were about six or seven. There's two left. I mean, I, I don't understand making it more difficult on them. There's no reason for it. Mm -hmm. let, let it stand as it is. You know, new people come in, they post their land the first thing they do, and they make all these rules. Uh, it's a little ridiculous. And uh, here, it's in land use, and we can't even hunt on their land or anything. And roomies have let bikers and s snow machines and cross-country skiers and for years and years use that land. Now we should do something for them. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Lee. Yeah. Thank you, Lee. So what do you propose the way to go forward from this, Eric? I, you could tell me tonight to take that proposed policy and throw it away and stay with what we have. It's, it's up to the board as to how they want the class four roads improved by private entities managed. So I, I don't I didn't come with an answer, a specific answer. I just came with a starting point. Right. And uh, there are there are other things to consider. Yeah. Uh, there are other requests out there and other roads that would have a great impact on some of the folks that live here. That are, they're here tonight speaking about. Yeah. There's been a request to improve Ross Hill Road from the Ron Terrell end. And I can tell you that if they do the improvements out there and bring it up to a standard of some sort, the dump trucks are probably going to destroy Ron Terrell Road. Right. And does the board want to be giving permission for those kind of improvements? But how do you address yes in Mud City, but no up there? Yeah. there there's many things to consider, and many property owners involved. I don't, didn't expect to get an answer tonight or anything, but looking for a starting point. I've heard some good things tonight, but this, this four-page document may be too cumbersome, may be too overbearing for what the select board feels is right for the citizens and right to protect the liabilities of the town. Yeah, I agree with that. I think we can file this somewhere else and build our own on the terms of their liabilities. <laughs> really. and, where, and then where does that lead? Like, does that end up leaving, like, for instance, like your situation, Selena, where you're just in a holding pattern and you can't? Until we get your permission. Mm -hmm. I think as long as you can work it out with the, the, you know, the owner of the class four road or the property around it, you can come to an agreement with them. And it was amicable for both of you. It would solve this situation. And meanwhile, we can work out trying to come up with a, a more reasonable policy that covers us. I just have a question. But I mean, sorry. Yeah, come on. Are we required to give permission? Yeah. Yes. We are. Yeah. This one. yeah. So I guess my question is um, if all the landowners on the bottom of Ron Terrell, you know, we got Steve, Ray, um, myself, and another fellow own another s section where we have a deer camp. And then we have the corner. Now, if we're against, and what's, what's going on on Ross Hill is some people bought a piece off of Donna Stafford, and they're kind of in the middle. Yeah. Why they, and this is kind of off topic, but why they don't come in from the Brook Road is beyond me. Why they want to come all the way up through and then down. So, 
if all the landowners on that road oppose bringing that road up, say these people, because I think they could probably afford it, say they said, we'll bring that whole road up from the Brook Road all the way up through. But if the, if the landowners on that road oppose that, how does that work? The governing board is the one that's <coughs> the How does that work? We don't know yet. We, we don't have a policy that we can really reference right now. From what, from what how other roads work, I would assume it would be our decision, not the, not the people who live on the road. Right. Yeah. Oh, so you could force us to widen that whole road. Or you could appeal to us so that we could say no. Well, the road is under our control. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I, un I understand. I understand that. I understand yeah. that. So, yeah. so that's why really we have to look at this policy to see how it's going to impact everybody, not just one person. Okay. Um, we try to come to an agreement where all parties can agree to have it and and make sure we don't have liabilities down. I see. And that's pretty reasonable. It may not be yeah. always simple to do that, but no, no, I think that makes we can sense. do it without having a crazy, you know, legal document like that that's going to, you know, just that's too much. I started reading it. I was like, you know, you point out all those things, Selena. <clears throat> it's just, it's the way the world's going now. Well, like Lee said, we're losing Vermont. We're losing it up there. And we're trying to hang on to it. Right. We're old school. Yes. And we're in the minority, and I understand that. But yeah. so anyway, I won't take any more. Thank you. I appreciate what you do in terms of land access and keeping it. A lot of people get yeah. yeah. it, but people yeah. yeah. don't yeah. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'd like to see us get talk to them maybe on the but maybe get another one. We could look at theirs. Another time, yeah. Yeah, that's who stole. Mm -hmm. And so a lot smaller than that. Second down. Um, Brian's talking. Yeah. All right, go ahead. I was just going to suggest maybe we should table this for tonight. It's been a long night, and I think we can uh, run out of it now a little bit too much. I'm waiting for that suggestion. This, uh, this agenda tonight was really like three meetings worth. And we're not done. I'll second his motion. Okay. To table it until next time we get some more. All right. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. Well, he's second. Oh, he's second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any further discussion on this? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion is passed. Aye. Next. Thanks for staying, folks. Anybody who's leaving, you can come to every meeting. You know, they're, they're really not all this fun, but we're, we're glad to have you. You're welcome to come. Your problem is, is you let Brian talk too much. Yeah. Bob, <laughs> well, I don't know if Julie has a question. She has a hand raised. So Lee said he's paying for the Julie, room. you have your hand raised. Do you have a question? <laughs> Sorry, I'm, my hand is raised so that I can speak on the community. Uh, okay, well, that's, that's a few down the line here. Yeah. All right, sorry about that. Okay. So next we'll do old business. Number one, finalize the 2023-2024 budget. How do we want to do this? So the last items remaining on the discussion from last meeting are the proposed new positions within town government being the, the police officer addition, the assistant zoning administrator position and increasing the recreation coordinator's position from the current part-time status to full-time status. And those are the, the only decisions that I'm aware of that need to be made prior to making a motion to approve the budget. What I handed out, you have in front of you, there are two scenarios that was mentioned in the last meeting. One of them was to have the zoning assistant half year, and you have a scenario that shows you what that would be. And the other scenario is to cut the zoning administrator uh, assistant altogether. Um, I got the feeling that you all approved the police officer, so I didn't give you a scenario like that. I can if you need me to. Um, but those were the two I thought 
you would want to see. If you want to see something different, I'm happy to do it. Well, this is good. Bob, Bob? Go ahead, John. My suggestion would be to, and Tina's already said this, keep the police officer, she said, keep the rec position, but I think it's time to cut the zoning administrator. Yeah, I'll second that. Yeah, I agree with that also. I actually spoke to Todd today, and, um, you know, after, this is what I thought anyway, but I, I had been volunteering Todd's uh, opinion that he didn't need to have a backup yet. Um, and I appreciate Eric's, Eric's uh, you know, what he did to make sure that there's always a backup for somebody. That's the one place in our town government that doesn't have a backup. And I appreciate that. Eric's brought that to our attention. And, um, but we're, you know, in a budget increase year that we have right now. I just don't think it's responsible to, to add another position that we can do without. And after spoke, speaking to Todd, he's like, he agrees. He said, I don't, I'm not going anywhere. Um, the other thing that was pointed out to me is that if something did happen to Todd, the select board can actually appoint a, a temporary zoning administrator to grant a permit if it's necessary. That can happen. So it's not like we're, you know, we can't do anything. There's like, there's nothing we can do until we hire another one. You know, that's possible. Uh, the only thing I, I would like to change on um, part of this is to, um, allocate some money for the zoning administrator so we can start having all the meetings, the DRB meetings and the planning council meetings on Zoom. And so we have uh, someone that's gonna take the minutes and someone will run the cameras. And that's, I don't know if it's $3,000 a year or whatever, but certainly a lot less than hiring an assistant. You, um, you mean hire somebody to do that for Todd? Yeah, hire, hire somebody to take the minutes and to run the Zoom portion for the DRB and the planning council minutes. Lots of people reached out to me, people have been talking about it for the past year, and none of us has, have done anything about it. And that's that's a big thing, Todd can't do it. Todd's, Todd's busy running the meeting. But if we could have somebody do that, that's not a huge cost, and that would go a long way, as far as I think, for zoning. So that, that's my, my suggestion, if we want to add something to that budget. Does that mean you can't have the meeting <coughs> at the golf course or some stuff, or? I don't know, I, I don't know that part you of it. You can still take the minutes and stuff and do that. You can still have the minutes, but. Up to the boards. You can yeah. do a Zoom meeting anywhere. You can't televise it anywhere, but you can. Right. You can, like on GMA TV, but you can do a Zoom meeting anywhere. Okay. Um, do you, were you saying something, <coughs> Eric, at one point that we had to, um, for the person to take minutes, they had to be a town employee. Did that, did that, did that no, they don't have to be a town employee. Oh, okay. I can tell you that Don Johnson hired a minutes taker. They don't attend the meetings. Okay. They look at the recording and they provide them a, okay. a book, mm -hmm. uh, literally, of the minutes. And it's nearly verbatim and it costs them per page. Mm -hmm. It's expensive and it's unnecessary because the minutes they take being paid by the page, it's in their best interest to make them longer and longer and longer and they over record. And they're excessively recording the, the minutes in the meeting, but we can we can explore something here and, and see what we can come up with. Having somebody run the meeting for Zoom, that's, everyone's asking about it. You know, I think because of the way things are now, people want to be able to have access to it and see it, and they don't see any of the DRB stuff. They don't see any of the planning council stuff, and but yet they can they can go back and look at any one of our meetings. And I just think it's appropriate to, to do that. We're going to more popular. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but to spend the money on that is, is a better thing to do right now. That's my opinion. I, I, Go ahead, Tom. I, I'm a little surprised about that. I'm, I'm really happy as, as could be. I mean, I, I've always pushed for transparency, and that is a major step to making all these board meetings transparent. And I, I mean, I couldn't agree more than a thousand percent. I'm glad Todd is. Is uh, is willing to do that? Uh, I just think that's a great idea. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. What can do with help? Yeah, yeah. Tom said he'd take the minutes. 
Yeah. So yeah. does that mean that we're not able to vote on this because we need to find I have to, I have to have your okay. vote tonight. Okay. So if you want to add something to the budget, right. a okay. dollar figure, okay. whatever, we can That's do that. Is. But I, I have to have an answer tonight. Do you want to say something? <laughs> to, uh, Up to $5,000. Yeah, sure. Up to $5,000. Yeah. $5,000 would cover about $200 a meeting. You'd put it on other contracted services in his budget? Uh, under Todd's? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I just need to know the dollar figure. Five thousand? Okay. That's all right. That's all I'm proposing. Okay. We'll go fishing, see if we can get someone for two hundred bucks, one hundred fifty dollars yeah. meeting river works out too. And that would five thousand be appropriate for that for both planning and DRV. Okay. What do you think of this, Don? I like the idea a lot. And as Tom said, you know, there's been a number of people in town pushing for this for the last year, so I I would support it, yes. And we really appreciate everything you do. We know you're overworked. Mm -hmm. I just can't do it all myself. And I know Eric in front of Zoom without Judy here, obviously. Yes. But I can't do the same either. And my days are talking more than Eric does. Yeah. And I can't do all this after so. <laughs> yeah. You do a great job, Judy. So Judy needs an assistant. Honestly, <laughs> honestly, I wouldn't mind having somebody to help me do the BCA and yeah. the board of the band. And we only meet a couple times a year, but I run the whole thing. Yeah. Do the minutes, and I I do provide Zoom, and it's it's difficult. It's hard. Mm -hmm. So maybe they could do both things. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, we'll have to have ten million. <laughs> I I only need a couple. No, if we're cutting this assistant position out, it's going to help quite a bit. This budget ain't going to pass, so you guys are wasting your time. Okay, thank you for your input. Yeah. That's up to the voters. Yeah. Tina, the will need to remember to take the $4,500 out of the income line for the Elmore subscription. Yeah, yeah, that is, I've got that written down here, okay. too. Yeah. So is there anything else you want from us with that budget? I, I guess I just need a motion on which one you want, and, and you can um, say that you want to add the $5,000, which, which scenario you want. Okay. I make a motion that we um, accept the um, the budget title, the amended items of cuts on 1227 zoning assistant cut, um, with the addition of a five thousand dollar um, a five thousand dollar line item to cover the um, to cover the cost of a um, a, a, a meetings a minute taker and a Zoom operator for. Can you also mention the $4,500 revenue decrease from Elmore? That will affect this as well. Um, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> is there a second? Second. Second by Judy. Any further discussion on this? Was wondering. Is it a revenue decrease or increase? It's a decrease. Um, a decrease. We had budgeted as if they were going to pay what we had oh, asked them. Okay. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Was wondering how. When we talked minute taker and Zoom, and I didn't know if Zoom costs would increase adding them on meetings. Anyways, just a thought. I just no. it's just no, one it's license, right? Yeah, it's one license. We're using my old license anyway, so it should all be the same. Okay. It's a good question. I have a question on Zoom. Go ahead, Julie. Are we, this is Julie Nephew, I'm asking, are we saying that the DRB meetings will now necessarily be? If this if this motion passes, then DRB meetings necessarily will be available by Zoom. Yes. Yes. Excellent. I approve it. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you can do that. Well, no. so you're, authorized, you're authorized. You're funding. Yeah. My, right. planning, my planning council discussed this before. They're finding on camera the DRB on the whole is not. So the DRB, we know, authorized and funding. They may choose not to use. But that's up to us, isn't it? It's up to the DRB. Yeah, we know it's not. not we talked about that before. We're, no. You're just authorizing five thousand dollars to pay for somebody to do it. Okay. If we, they do so, it. I'm yeah. sorry, I couldn't hear what Todd said. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. He's coming to the mic. Thanks, Todd. No problem. Sorry. The five thousand dollars is funding to use uh, Zoom for planning and DRB. <clears throat> if I'm speaking to both boards previously, planning will use that funds. And uh, if we can find someone to do it, they'll go on Zoom. The DRB likely will not. I can't speak for the board, but the board is, uh, that board, the majority seems disinclined to be on Zoom. 
from during the pandemic when we had to meet in Zoom. It's horribly unproductive to do site plans on someone's trying to look at a cell phone or a tablet and you need a two by three sheet to really understand a plan. So it was, uh, the DRB may choose not to use that money. If it doesn't get used, it goes back to the general fund. But planning will. But they can get pressure from the public. I, I would pressure back that the DRB meetings should be available on Zoom. People should be able to hear what people are saying, even if they can't necessarily see all the little uh, site plans. Thank this you. This is ridiculous. Yeah, thank you. So one thing I don't think we should be doing is guaranteeing that the meeting is going to be there just because right. the money's yeah. growing. Yeah. 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 It might go, what if it goes over the 5,000? Are we going to stop then? And what if it doesn't work? should come over. So I don't want to see. You're providing the funding, you're, but you're not. Right. You can't I don't want to guarantee that right. the board's going to. Correct. Right. And I can't guarantee that either. Right. But we're opening it. We're trying. We're making it much easier. All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion is passed unanimously. Is there anything else for the budget? That's it. That's it. All right. Next, approve warrants. Next so, motion made approval. Second. Motion by Brian. Second by. See how fast they go. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. <laughs> motion is passed unanimously. <laughs> TA report, Eric. The uh, I'll make this quick. The construction of phase two of the upstairs office area has been done. Uh, they're making excellent headway. Uh, Insulation is going in this week. Uh, Sheetrock's coming right behind that. Electrical's been pulled, so uh, they're, they're making uh, great gains. Um, all our town office staff attended a Zoom training by put on by VLCT last Friday, uh, which covered uh, First Amendment audits. And if you're not familiar with those, there are folks in the community that are in society who find it. I'll use the word entertaining, but I'm not sure. Uh, that's the right word, but they come in with a video or a, a uh, recording device, video recording device, into a public entity, a government's offices, and they just start videotaping without explanation. And what they are really looking for is a confrontation. They want a staff member to tell them they need to stop videotaping. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they are looking for the police to come in and arrest them and remove them while they're videotaping, but they're in an actual public space where there is no expectation of privacy. And uh, so I just, we thought uh, Paula took the training first, suggested it for all of the staff, uh, and it was a means for us to open the discussion and just talk about if it should happen, it's not something to be afraid of. It is simply something that we need to know how to manage, basically what it is. And quite frankly, if, if the less confrontational you are, the, the shorter the period of time they're here. If they don't get any confrontation, then they got nothing to post up on YouTube. And some of them use this as a means of uh, making money. They look for donations from the public to keep posting such videos. So. Um, I met with Victoria Hoig, who is the newest assistant planner for LCPC, and Rob Moore, who's a senior planner there. Uh, Victoria is uh, brought to us, a, a, well, as a meet and greet, brought to us a, a grant opportunity that may be coming up in the near future. I wanted to know if we were interested in it. It had everything to do with energy savings. And I said, well, you couldn't have come at a better time because our town plan is telling us we need to do that. So uh, more to come on that, but it was nice to meet her and uh, continue uh, growing the relationships across the street. Uh, and Judy asked me today, or sent me a message and wanted to know about uh, warming centers in, in light of the Christmas weekend storm. Uh, warming centers where we, you know where we, it's not on our web page where you find that information so she asked me to explain the actions that were taken in, in advance of the storm so i met with uh, my department heads in advance of the storm talked to them about uh, what we might be facing what needs of the community might be there and we talked to and, and had them you know prepared i talked to denny about possibly using the meeting room at the fire station as a temporary warming station since they have a generator operating for that building, if the electricity goes out in the village, that they could, uh, at least in the short term, during the daytime, provide a warning center for folks there. Uh, the school, talked to Ryan Harry, the superintendent. He said, absolutely, it's in part of our emergency operations plan that I have to update every year, that the school is a uh, place for overnight housing, except they do not have a generator. 
So in the event that there was electricity and we had a large volume of people, uh, then they would be, they'd be happy to host that. We'd call the Red Cross and ask for their assistance and get them in there. If those weren't available, then I would be reaching out to Vermont Emergency Management and asking them for assistance from the National Guard. We have an army here in town. Uh, I have some contacts still in the National Guard from my time in there, and uh, I spoke to the NCOIC up the building, asked what they had for amenities and could they support overnight, <coughs> folks staying overnight. And they have had recently done a major reconstruction there to their bathrooms. They're all handicapped accessible. And uh, so they are very much capable of doing it. But I have to go through my emergency management because if they use non-full timers uh, to staff it, then they have to activate the guard. They, they would most likely use full-time staff with the National Guard, so they wouldn't have to do that activation to support that. But again, that would be most likely in conjunction with a Red Cross request. But those, are, those sites are really for large quantities of folks who we need long term and then the Red Cross can help place them out in, uh, in the community as far as the different places to stay. Um, so those, those plans were in place every day. There was a briefing from Vermont Emergency Management that I sat in on at 11 o'clock and they outlined what was going on around the state, power outages, the, the conditions of uh, highways, roads, and then uh, what was available for warming shelters. Uh, Barry Auditorium was opened for a warming shelter and overnight stays. It was staffed by the Red Cross and nobody came. Um, they had many warming centers up and down the Champlain Valley on the other side of the mountains from us. Um, and they were, they were greatly underutilized, but they were there. So they, they opened them. They were the ones that were most hit by power outages in that area. And then the Washington County, Orange County area uh, saw some long-term losses. But uh, we, never, we never had a request for uh, any of that stuff. Our police officers knew that if they received a request or understand that during their travels if the power was out they had the ability to to speak to folks say look if you need help let us know you know so it's a we we made some preparations in advance we didn't put anything on the website because it was really going to be a as needed and if there was only a couple of people i would have, would have notified the board and asked for perhaps some local resources to get them over the, the hump for that stuff but Fortunately for us, the Marshall Water and Light, our highway department got out there and they did a great job getting lights turned back on here in our area, so we weren't, we didn't need to use any of those facilities. Thank you, Eric. Okay, is that all you have? That's all I got. Any questions for Eric? No. Thank you. Uh, next, select board concerns. Judy. I've totally forgotten everything. <laughs> 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 I had some things in mind and they're gone. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes, I um, ran to announce, I announced already on Front Porch Forum. I will be running for re-election um, in the next election cycle. Um, it's become a big burden on my family. Um, the, um, the meeting schedule, um, when I first came on, when I was appointed, and then when I ran again, um, I had a much more flexible job. Um, I'm a first year um, high school teacher. Um, I have a three-year-old daughter, and we don't have a lot of support beyond just my husband and I at home. So um, I really appreciate um, all the support that I've gotten from the board and from the town. Um, and I hope to um, rejoin um, town government in the future, um, either um, you know, running in for the select board when my daughter's older, or um, at least serve on some um, town committees. Um, I'm interested um, to learn more about the, um, the housing committee. Um, so I'm still here, um, and again, I appreciate um, all your patience and um, support of me, and I, I do regret leaving, um, and I also regret that you've invested so much in getting me up to speed, and then, well, you know, there'll be someone else in my place, but I'm sure they'll do great. Um, so that's my announcement. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Jeff. Brian. I'm all set. Don. Uh, I'll be quick. I had a couple things here. Special thanks to Sarah Haskins for prepping for tonight's meeting. She obviously did a lot of work and really appreciate that. That took up a lot of our time, of course, tonight. Uh, thank you to all the staff, Tina in particular, for all the work on the budget. And uh, it was obviously a very, very difficult budget this year. Uh, also, I do have on my list, uh, sorry to see you go, Jess. And uh, I understand fully. I know the demands of the job that you're in right now. So I certainly, certainly get all that. 
And lastly, I'm just going to say I am out of state right now visiting family and they've been waiting for three and a half hours for me to get into the living room patiently. So I am going to sign off. Um, but thanks, everybody, and we'll see you all soon. Thanks, Don. <coughs> and I'm good tonight. I think we've had enough. <laughs> so move on to community concerns. Do we have any community concerns tonight? I have one. This is Julie Nephew. Julie, go ahead. So I am very interested in the idea of a housing moratorium. I completely oppose it. I think housing is the lifeblood of a community. It is the economic engine that drives prosperity. And uh, one of the components of that parking and right now this board has a moratorium on a parking waiver for housing in the downtown community uh, it, that is under the bylaws actually permitted let me let me turn on my video I'm sorry about that anyway so so right now my understanding is that there's a moratorium on a parking waiver for buildings in the downtown and parking and housing go hand in hand if you so what carrie told us is there's not enough housing and housing 30 percent of one's income for housing is normal across the country if you're a homeowner, according to HUD, but transportation can add 40% to that cost. And living in a downtown center can reduce that cost. I urge this board to eliminate the housing moratorium. Todd told me that it will be a year before he can grant a permit on development of the nephew building and one year when it's in the town plan to develop it is ridiculous this this board needs to decide do you want the nephew building developed or do you want to prevent housing or do you want to encourage both it's all based on housing and parking i i plead with you to eliminate the moratoriums let people develop their buildings and their housing because that's the only way morrisville will thrive thank you julie thank you. who else has go ahead oh, go ahead you can go first yeah. I'll be brief. I already emailed you, Jess, but I just wanted to publicly say thank you. That's all. Yeah, that's nice. Usually I don't know when to be quiet. Tonight I do. I don't have anything. You don't have anything, Tom? No, thank you. Tony, do you have something? Yeah, real quick. And then Alan does. So when I come in here tonight, the room was full, and now I look at it. It's empty. Community concerns. What's the reason why it has to be less? It's 9.30. There's no reason for it. Exactly, because the idea is we get all the other business of the town done first. And that was recommended to us, wasn't it, by VLCT? Mm -hmm. to have it recommended by VLCT that we not have community concerns. Right. They, they don't even want us to have it. But the idea is to get all the business of the town done first. The community concerns was my idea 15 years ago. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, it's come a long way. We don't. So. Yeah. Yeah. Brian's still mad at me about it. But. So why can't we move it up? Some people, I think you probably we have, have more. Get our business went first. If, if you really want to show your concern, you stay to the end. I mean, I'm, I get up at 3 a.m., so I'm here. I'm here as long as the last person is. I'm Put really it in the sorry. budget. I, I'm with you. I did not vote to move it to the end. No, Jess didn't. I, I'm with you. She's the only one that did. I didn't hear what his concern was. He didn't like the idea of when 
committee concerns was at the end of the meeting. I don't like it either, but I didn't hear whether he had a, a particular concern. No. No. I got all kinds of concerns. <laughs> Sir, you want to come up? Ten million yeah. I don't know if this is the right time to bring it up. I'm Alan Ward. I live up on Fontaine Hill Road. I'm hearing through the grapevine that they want to trade our excavator off. Is this the time to be talking about this? Mm-hmm. You can. And the backhoe. And they want to buy a rubber tired excavator. That's correct. I've tried one. Useless. You want to call I've them before? Draw an old one. They, they, Westford has one. They don't use it no more. They gone to a track hole. Jericho bought one that I tried for them. It's gone. They've got a track hole now. And what's wrong with the one that we got? Excavator. That was the idea to. Um combined equipment so we didn't have the rubber tote rubber tired excavator a regular ex a rubber tired backhoe the excavator and a trailer to bring it down to one piece of equipment that we can drive and do the work on the side of the roads you're never going to be able to get off the road with it well uh, the, we have two excavators i just j jump in a little bit i think that's part of the reason why is our use for this rubber tired excavator isn't to put a excavator a contractor's excavator we are on the roads the, the uses that we have it for are ditching. It's, exactly. it's, it's, on, it's on the roadway. And I, the highway department is the one that came up with the proposal. Um, they understand the limitations on the rubber tire excavator, mm -hmm. but in the, in the line of work that they're in and, and the work that they do perform with that, they're, they're reasonably sure it'll, it'll suit, fit the bill and be able to reduce the amount of equipment we have to maintain. Well, I hope you try one before you buy one. Thank you. Understood. I really think you should. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other community concerns? Come on up, Barry. Barry Russo. There are those who say Vermont's biggest liability is the fact that it has not changed with the times. And then there are those of us who say Vermont's biggest asset is the fact that it has not changed with the times. I, for one, would like to keep it that way. Thank you. Thank you. Any other community concerns? <clears throat> Hearing none. Any other business? Yes. Uh -huh. Sorry. Right I know you're sick of me, but I spoke forever about clerk. Now I'm coming to you as delinquent tax collector. Um, just to let you know, everybody that um, was up for tax sale has been has paid in full, so there will be no tax sale this week. Yay. Awesome. Is that a first? No, but uh -huh. that's good. That's great news. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great news. Good. So there are, our money was worth it. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So I make a motion to adjourn. A motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed?